I got your wig, I got your wig, ho. Ha ha. You're mad, Miss Wickiana. Miss Wig, Miss Wig, Miss Wickiana. Miss Wig. What else do you see in their eyes that lets you know that you can get away with it? Because nobody's choosing any child. I say this to all my girls at school. Nobody's choosing any child who has the confidence and the self-esteem and is going to, yeah. th th that, that they tell. think is going to we'll tell. Scream. Nobody's choosing anybody yeah. that they think is going to tell. <laughs>
immediately flew over from the United States. They spent a week interviewing girls and staff. I arrived before the team. I was accompanied by Dr. Bruce Perry, and I spoke to all the girls personally, and I encouraged all of them, any of them who had, had actually been harmed, to please come forward and to trust the team and speak to the team and the police. And I told them that although they had apparently been living in an atmosphere that repressed their voices, that this was a chance for them to break the silence and to take their voices back. As a result of that conversation with the girls, by the next day, five other brave girls had come forward. But all the girls were afraid of repercussions from the remaining dorm matrons. So we immediately removed all remaining dorm matrons and put teachers in rotation in the dorms. That weekend, which was Sunday, October 14th, we had enough information by that time about the specific nature of the girls' complaints that we then started calling all of their parents to inform them of the situation and to ask for a meeting the following weekend. Then the following weekend of October 20th, I returned again to South Africa and I met with the parents and their daughters. I apologized for the unfortunate circumstances that we are enduring and I promised to institute immediate changes to create a new model of excellence in social, emotional, and academic life for girls at the school. Does that feel okay? Are you uh -huh. Toss it. Hi, how are you? I'm Dennis. Sorry. Hi, Dennis. If you now seize the opportunity, and that's why this is such a victory, uh, tomorrow you will hear me doing the yay, 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 dance because it's a victory celebration. It's a victory dance for, <clears throat> we're taking the victory lap here, for um, transformation and asset building for these girls. So every single girl's going to leave here with something greater to offer the world than her body. And when a girl is allowed to have value beyond her body, her family and her community begin to see her with, um, with an eye of respect and value for themselves. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Reese. In 1964, I was a little girl sitting on the linoleum floor of my mother's house in Milwaukee, watching Anne Bancroft present the Oscar for Best Actor at the 36th Academy Awards. She opened the envelope and said five words that literally made history. The winner is Sidney Poitier. Up to the stage came the most elegant man I had ever seen. I remember his tie was white and of course his skin was black and I'd never seen a black man being celebrated like that. And I have tried many, many, many times to explain what a moment like that means to a little girl, a kid watching from the cheap seats as my mom came through the door, bone tired from cleaning other people's houses. But all I can do is quote and say that the explanation in Sydney's performance in Lilies of the Phil, amen, 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 amen. In 1982, Sydney received the Cecil B. DeMille Award right here at the Golden Globes. And it is not lost on me that at this moment, there are some little girls watching as I become the first black woman to be given the same award. It is an honor. It is an honor. And it is a privilege to share the evening with all of them and also with the incredible men and women who've inspired me, who've challenged me, who've sustained me and made my journey to this stage possible. Dennis Swanson, who took a chance on me for AM Chicago. Quincy Jones, who saw me on that show and said to Steven Spielberg, yes, she is Sophia in the color purple. Gail, who has been the definition of what a friend is, and Stedman, who's been my rock, just a few to name. I'd like to thank the Hollywood Foreign Press Association, because we all know that the press is under siege these days. But we also know that it is the insatiable dedication to uncovering the absolute truth that keeps us from turning a blind eye to corruption and to injustice. <laughs> to, to tyrants and victims and secrets and lies. I want to say that I value the press more than ever before as we try to navigate these complicated times, which brings me to this. What I know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. And I'm especially proud and inspired by all the women who have felt strong enough and empowered enough to speak up and share their personal stories. Each of us in this room, are celebrated because of the stories that we tell. And this year, we became the story. But it's not just a story affecting the entertainment industry. It's one that transcends any culture, geography, race, religion, politics, or workplace. So I want tonight to express gratitude to all the women who have endured years of abuse and assault because they, like my mother, had children to feed and bills to pay and dreams to pursue. They, they, they're the women whose names we'll never know. They are domestic workers and farm workers. They are working in factories and they work in restaurants and they're in academia and engineering and medicine and science. They're part of the world of tech and politics and business. There are athletes in the Olympics and there are soldiers in the military. And there's someone else, Reese Taylor. 
a name I know and I think you should know too. In 1944, Reese Taylor was a young wife and a mother. She was just walking home from a church service. She attended in Abbeville, Alabama, when she was abducted by six armed white men, raped and left blindfolded by the side of the road, coming home from church. They threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone. But her story was reported to the NAACP where a young worker by the name of Rosa Parks became the lead investigator on her case. And together, they sought justice. But justice wasn't an option in the era of Jim Crow. The men who tried to destroy her were never persecuted. Reese Taylor died 10 days ago just shy of her 98th birthday. She lived, as we all have lived, too many years in a culture broken by brutally powerful men. For too long, women have not been heard or believed if they dared to speak their truth to the power of those men. But their time is up. The time is up. The time is up. And I just hope, I just hope that Reese Taylor died knowing that her truth, like the truth of so many other women who were tormented in those years, and even now, tormented, goes marching on. It was somewhere in Rosa Parks' heart almost 11 years later when she made the decision to stay seated on that bus in Montgomery. And it's here with every woman who chooses to say, me too. And every man, every man who chooses to listen. In my career, what I've always tried my best to do, whether on television or through film, is to say something about how men and women really behave, to say how we experience shame, how we love and how we rage, how we fail, how we retreat, persevere, and how we overcome. I've interviewed and portrayed people who've withstood some of the ugliest things life can throw at you, but the one quality all of them seem to share is an ability to maintain hope for a brighter morning, even during our darkest nights. So I want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon. And when that new day finally dawns, It will be because of a lot of magnificent women, many of whom are right here in this room tonight, and some pretty phenomenal men fighting hard to make sure that they become the leaders who take us to the time when nobody ever has to say, me too, again. Thank you. Let's go back to the Golden Globes for a second. Oprah is now being criticized for her speech that night by a very unlikely star. Me too. Three days after Oprah publicly supported victims of sexual assault in the wake of numerous allegations against Harvey Weinstein, singer Seal Instagram this meme. Showing Winfrey kissing the disgraced mogul, it reads, when you have been part of the problem for decades, but suddenly they all think you are the solution. Please welcome the 54-year-old who's appeared on Oprah's show captioned his post, Oh, I forgot. That's right. You'd heard the rumors, but you had no idea he was actually serially assaulting young starry-eyed actresses. My bad. While Weinstein maintains his innocence, Seal hasn't commented further, and Oprah has not responded. This moment is a really powerful time for everybody to get woke. Next, to those of us who support the Me Too movement, just know this. Not one of the women who have been sexually abused, not one of the women who have come forward has received 
any real justice whatsoever. Losing your job because you either A, raped, B, sexually abused, or even sexually harassed a woman is not real punishment. You steal from the post office, you go to jail. And hashtag real talk for a second, we all know what would happen to any one of those power abusers if they looked like me. In order to promote social awareness dialogue on this particular subject, I repost, not create, but repost a meme that appeared on my social feed and now all of a sudden it's a brother tearing down a sister issue. Let me make something abundantly clear to you. I am English born, but don't get that baby kiss from a rose stuff twisted. See these scars on my face? My parents are from Africa, more specifically Nigeria, and I am about as black as you will ever get. What I reposted was not an attack on Oprah at all. She just happened to be the person photographed with the pig in the picture. No, what I reposted was commentary on the hypocritical and double standard nature and behavior of Hollywood. And at this point, I am absolutely overwhelmed because he repeated so many times, it's going to be good for you. I have something in mind for you. We're gonna be in touch. And he was with people in which I admired dearly. He was with Naomi Campbell. He had Oprah Winfrey there with him who entered the room and was swinging off his arm and just seemed like a very dear friend. And these like Oprah, Naomi, Rita and Georgina, they all sat at his table. And for me, you know, meeting Oprah was like, oh my God, like I would have thought that I would have to be someone who is established, who everyone would have had to know about before I was privileged enough to meet someone like Oprah. So that gave me so much confidence in him at the time when he approached me. I thought, obviously this man has something amazing in store for me. Okay. So following, following your first meeting, what happened? I, after meeting him, I then visited his London office where I spoke with his executive assistant, Vanessa Ford, who asked me quite a bit about my life, my background, and took notes and asked me to provide a show reel and a brief letter which she'll forward to Harvey and he'll take a look at this. She also told me that when Harvey selects his girls, he, uh, he'll, he'll have something in mind for them or he might put them in a movie immediately. So I sent Vanessa a letter with a few images and my showreel, which she said she'll forward to Harvey Weinstein. Okay, so go on. So then what happened next? So this, yeah, so then I went to Cannes in May 2014. And whilst I was there, Harvey Weinstein approached me in the Majestics, in the lobby. I was really, really happy when he approached me. And I asked him, had he received my showreel? I had my iPad with me at the time. And he said to me he had not received, he, he, he hadn't received it. No. I told her everything in the sense of like he took advantage, advantage, he assaulted me, he, he forced me to do things with him that I wasn't comfortable with and all these promises and how this has gone on for so many years and it's like all the reassurance and, and it just made no sense but um, and she was reassuring me, telling me that she's going to organize a meeting herself personally. And she said to me that Harvey may have not realized the impact in which he had on my life. Because I explained to her my therapy sessions and how much it's broken my trust in the industry because I've looked up to Harvey as such a powerful infl influence. And for me, like meeting him was, you know, like, he was like everything. Now I feel stupid to put so much trust in him, but 
That's what I thought at the time, and I... The reason why I said nothing for so long, because I thought if I ever wanted an opportunity in this industry, how could I ever small me to speak of this man, to say he has been inappropriate with me? People would look at me, who the hell is this girl? To say this about this god or powerful influence who is able to make such amazing things take place. But, uh, so yeah, I, um, so she, she, she said to me I should write a letter to him and she kept reassuring me that he's a, he's a good man and he's been so good to her and I should put in a letter everything in which I feel and she would ensure this letter gets to him. And it was at that point I thought this man has so much walls built up around him and I had no chance and I just felt completely played. So I didn't write that letter because I felt like the show will, which I don't believe she passed on to him, like the email she said she was going to send Charlotte to ensure Charlotte got in touch with me, she did not send to Charlotte. And this letter that, of closure in which she's asking me to provide, I felt, again, she was just saying whatever she needed to to make me feel better. So, I never, I never thought I would ever be able to talk about this. This is an interview I wasn't sure would ever happen. One of the most famous spiritual healers in the world rarely talks to anyone on camera. John of God agreed to sit down with me under a mango tree on the grounds of the casa. A group of his patients gathered to watch. John of God speaks only Portuguese, so Heather Cumming helped translate. Ready, guys? You describe yourself as a spiritual medium. What does that mean, a medium? Medium, I am a spiritualist. As a medium, he's a spiritualist. He believes a great deal in God, and he practices this mission already 55 years. Born on a farm to a family who rarely had enough to eat, Joao Tejera de Fria was the youngest of six children. His father was a tailor, his mother a housewife who also ran a small hotel to make ends meet. Joao left school when he was seven to work in his father's tailor shop. To this day, he cannot read or write. As a boy, Joao says he realized he was clairvoyant when he predicted a terrible storm that destroyed a neighboring village. This event began his journey as a spiritual medium. Are we all, in some sense, missionaries of God? Are we all, do we all have the possibility in our own way to be a medium for God? Todos nós somos medium. Everybody is é a medium who practices good. Yes. And we are all children of God. Yes. And each person has their mission. Yes. The first time I saw it today, I was humbled by the experience. Ela disse, quando ela viu primeiro as pessoas hoje, um pouco, isso aqui pertence a você. Because a little bit of this belongs to you. Mm. A part of this belongs to you. How so? I don't understand. Because you are você. human. Mm. Well, could the entity tell me, what does human energy look like? Because as I understand it, each person that comes before you, the entity sees the energy of that person. Mm -hmm. We have an aura. We have energia. different colors in our aura. So human energy looks like colors? Si. Yes. Va various, various different colors. Mm -hmm. What does something like cancer look like when you see inside? Quando, quando vê aranha. Sendo da vontade de Deus, não em... When he sees cancer, he starts asking that this be taken away, be removed, um, being God's will, because it is not his, he does not have the power, it is God who has the power, and he prays to have the person's cancer removed by God. So what do you mean you had the surgery? Well, 
I was a, a skeptical, but you know, when you have leukemia and someone stay said, with me, people, because this is as woo woo as I know woo-woo. how I know how this sounds. It, this it sounds is like yeah. woo. It sounds crazy. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Raina, Raina uh, Piskova calls me from uh, down in Abidjan. Okay. She had the surgery. I had the surgery. Now the surgery. This is a guy who can do surgery to a thousand people in a room at the same time. This is not. He he is not somebody who does the surgery. Okay, he doesn't he doesn't remember any of it that he does. You can watch him do it. He goes he gets into this thing and he uh, he picks up these instruments and you can actually see pictures of the entities that enter his body as he as he does this. I know when you're going down there, you'll see. I'm going down. Well, you to, did a whole show on it. I, I mean, did, but somebody every time I've heard about him or talked about mm-hmm. him or even written about him in the magazine, it has been through somebody else's right, eyes. Right. And I keep hearing well, these stories and hearing I had these a direct stories. experience, a direct experience. So, I so anyway, so I went to bed. I didn't feel anything. Nothing changed. It this was is like, after you've taken the I, herbs. I, I took the herbs. She said you'll wake up the next at seven o'clock. The, she told me what time the surgery was at seven o'clock. She said you'll get up at eight o'clock, and then you'll drink some of the water, the blessed water, and you'll go right back to bed for 24 hours. Let, let's get to the surgery part. Okay, the so, surgery is just—it's a remote surgery. I mean, it, it was 12,000 miles from where I was, so it's—you um, know—I don't—I don't know what happened. These are entities. They don't have any form. They're just uh, these spirits that that enter his body. It's been going on for 40 years okay, to 25 million people. Okay, so tell me this. People. Does he tell you a certain time to lay down, a certain way yeah. to lay down? No, just go to bed, wear white, just wear everything is white, well, drink the water, uh-huh. take the herbs, yeah. and uh, and don't have sex, and don't uh, don't eat spicy food, uh, and don't eat pork. Um, but basically, that's that's it, okay? So... I did everything. I went to bed. I, you know, I got up. Were you skeptical as I am right now? Yes. Because this sounds yes. crazy. I know. I know. It was. But, but that's because we have been conditioned to believe that, yes. that, uh, that, that you know, there's a... This is my limited self-talking. Okay. But here's a, here's a line from, from Jesus, you know, with God. Yes. All, all things, things are possible. possible. Hope can be an extremely powerful emotion. It can pull us through tough times and help overcome adversity. But hope can be a weakness too, making vulnerable people easy prey for the worst of humans. I've just met one such man, a man who claims to work miracles and heal the sick. He calls himself John of God, but there's nothing godly about him. Thousands of people flock to him, hoping for a cure to their pain, but leave fleeced of their money. You see, John of God's supposed healing isn't free. He's a thrifty businessman making tens of millions of dollars. And worst of all, our government's just granted him a visa and next month he'll bring his show to Australia. Am I speaking with John of God now or an entity? With John indeed. How does the healing work? This is the power of God because I don't cure anyone. Who cures people is God. There is a big business around your spirit here. Is this more about money than it is miracles? These are questions that were in the list. Recent years, two deaths at John of God's compound warranted police investigations, but no charges were laid. And in 2010, US detectives investigated allegations of sexual assault allegedly committed by him. In this report from the Sedona Police Department, the victim states John Faria took her hand and placed it on his genitals. She also says, he tried to pull down her skirt. Somebody is saying that John harassed sexually somebody while he was here in Sedona. Was... Later, a friend of Mr. Faria's allegedly met with the victim, asking her to drop the complaint. This is an apparent recording of that conversation. I really need to be able to say that hey, you do not have anything against us. I need you to put this in writing. That there is nothing that you are saying against us against the casa and against John. The case never made it to court. Mr. Faria returned to Brazil where he has nine children to three wives. Well, let me ask you then, have you ever sexually assaulted any of your followers? Could you, uh, anyone interpret that for me? His team refused to translate my question. John of God, could we ask you a few more questions, please? No, I mean, these are... No. Just to properly understand exactly who you are, suddenly silent, He waited until he was around the corner, away from the camera, to insult our interpreter 
as she was translating my question. Have you ever sexually assaulted any of your followers? When she asked if he'd sexually assaulted anyone, he stared her down and said, your mother. Winfrey and I have a problem is Oprah Winfrey called us up and she said my brother wanted to come on the show and talk about him molesting me and he wanted to tell other parents how to look out for molesters. My brother Gerald is a charmer so my mind thought was because she said, do you want to come on? I said, I don't want nothing to do with that cat. I said, nigga, I know it's up to a scam, but people can change. And who am I to say he hasn't changed? It might really be different. So I don't want to get in the way of that. I just don't want nothing to do with it. She said, if you don't want me to have your brother on the show, I will cancel the show. No show will happen but I wanted to call you up to see how you felt first. When I hung up that phone, brother, I looked at my husband, I said, that bitch is all right with me. That's a real- Cause she kept it, cause she- Cause she didn't have to call me up. She didn't have to say my brother was coming. She could have just ran with the shit and let it happen. I dig her for that. Now I begin to see commercials with my brother, my mother, my father and my other brother. Now, the reason why that means so much is because in the conversation we had about my brother, we then went deeper. And we began to talk about our relationships with our mothers and our fathers. And I shared my relationship with her about my mother as she shared hers with me, which I will never repeat because she shared it with me about her mother and father. It might be something she shared with everybody but made one to make me feel special. I don't know, nonetheless, it was in our moment. I shared with her that me and my mother was not talking. I shared with her we were in a really bad place. I shared with her I was hurt and, you know, trying to figure this thing out. She never said my mother was coming on that show because had Oprah Winfrey said, I'm going to have your mother, I would have said, shut it down. I don't need the world seeing how greedy my mother is. Shut that down. That's one of the reasons why we don't communicate because of my mother and father's greed. So I would, if you had given me the opportunity, I would have said, I can't put my mother, that's still my mother. Right. Okay. Now here comes this show and here comes the commercials. And now I'm starting to see my mother and my father and my other brother who was my manager. We didn't discuss that, Oprah. Wait, he was your manager and he went to Oprah? Wasn't my manager time. Okay. By now I had already, you know, fired him. Gotcha. So I'm watching this show and I'm watching my father sit there who was a strong alcoholic. I'm watching him drunk. I'm watching my mother be greedy. I'm watching my other brother who was my manager be greedy. I know my family. And I'm watching my brother who molested me sit on this stage, trying to paint this picture of I'm trying to be a help, but now I'm watching the scam. As much as they keep talking, I'm seeing the scam take place. Well, when it was all said and done, Oprah Winfrey calls me. Mm. And in that moment, I was still stuck in, this is Oprah Winfrey. How do I say, you had my mother? my father, my other brother, and I'm stuck in that moment. And when we hung up that phone, my husband looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? That's not what we made of. You know how you felt about that and how you feel about that. And you need to let that woman know, I don't care about a title and a position. That's not what you cut from. So it was my obligation to let Oprah Winfrey know how I really felt. Now I want you to understand something too. See, this is why me and Oprah Winfrey got a problem. It's still, it's still, it's still there. Until that woman says, let me apologize to you publicly, it'll be to the day I leave this earth. Because what you did was malicious and it was intentional and it was ugly.
If Oprah was watching this, what would you tell her? I would say, Oprah Winfrey, you know what you need to do. And stop hiding behind what you call was negative comments, what you call, oh, I don't even deal with things like that. Because what people are beginning to do is see you for who you are. Let them know what you said, which is the reason why there's a problem, because she did actually confront. Alfred Woodard had a Oscar um, party for the previous black woman that won Oscars and for the black woman that was nominated, and it was Lapita's turn that year. And she had had them all the other years, and I had declined. Just my schedule wouldn't let me do it, or, you know, for whatever reason. I was like, no, thank you. But this year, I said, okay. And Oprah Winfrey was going to be there. Now, keep in mind, I was trying to reach out to have this private conversation. No return calls, whatever number she did give, no longer work. Just, you know, what, however it went, I could not get to Oprah Winfrey. So I see her this night. And... Alfred Woodard says to me, we want you to understand, Monique, when we go into the red room, you can say whatever's on your heart. Almost like there was a universal energy where this sister knew something needed to be said. I can't say it factually, but you know, she said it to me a few times. Whatever you need to say, this is the place to say it. Whatever you need to say, this is the place to say it. So they were going around the room getting people's feelings on how they felt about when they got this Oscar. And it got to be my turn. And I really wasn't impressed with the Oscar. So I really didn't have anything to say to Lapita other than, baby, play it your way. This is your turn. So do it the way you want to do it. So you don't look back and say, I wish I would have. No one else can tell you how to do it, but you can do it your way, because it's your name that will be called. You're the nominee. And then I looked to Oprah Winfrey. And I said, you know you and I need to have this conversation. Why would you have my mother on your show? This is from? In front of everyone. So for all the women that were there, the one thing, people can say I'm loud, they can say I'm tactless, they can say I'm, I'm overbearing, as Oprah Winfrey has considered me, but what they've never said is she's a liar. Ain't nobody ever said Monique is lying. So for all them women that was there that night, they know exactly what was said. And I said to her, how could you have my mother on your show? That's not what we discussed. And you don't understand what I've had to walk through since you've had my mother on your show. See, I got to deal with women coming up to me in the Walmart saying, Monique, your mama ain't shit. I got to deal with that. Now, I got to defend. They ain't lying, but I still got to defend it because that's my mother. Right. Okay, daddy, but that's the truth. But I still got to defend it. You don't understand what position you put me in doing that. So now this is my moment to talk to you. And what she did was took the cowardly way out. I won't call her a coward. I'll say it was cowardly, but it was okay. And she said, if you think I did something wrong, I want to apologize. And what my husband taught me a long time ago, an apology is not something that you think you think you need to give. If somebody else thinks you need to give it, it's what you feel. So she came off like Mother Earth that she is. If you think I did something wrong. No, Oprah, it ain't what I think. You did do something wrong. You maliciously and you had full intentions of having my parents on your show and not saying anything to me. Was that for ratings? It seemed like she exploited the situation. Were you just exploiting me? There are some sisters in this business that are about it, about it. Regina King was there that night. Angela Bassett was there that night. Lynn Whitfield was there that night. Mm. Curry Washington was there that night. There's some sisters that are truly bout it, bout it, because they sat back in those chairs. And they were looking like, what we know Monique ain't doing is lying. That's what we know she ain't doing. So when it comes to Oprah Winfrey, let me be clear so people, I'm a little black fat girl from Baltimore, Maryland. And I saw this fat black woman on a TV show called People Are Talking. That was a local show. And she had big shoulders and a big bush and big feet like me. And I said, wow, when I grow up, that's what I want to do. And then we took a field trip to that studio. And I hugged that woman. And I said, when I grow up, Miss Winfrey, I want to do what you do. And she said, you know, you got to work really hard. 
So the day I walked out on that stage to the Oprah Winfrey show, and I was promoting Roscoe Jenkins. And after that show, that woman hugged me and said, when I look at you, I ain't doing nothing but looking at me. And then when I remind her that that's what she said to me, she says, oh, I say that to everybody. Well, then what does that make you? Everybody reminds you of you? Or do you just say things in the moment? So when I say to our community, I know Oprah Winfrey when the curtains are closed. I know it when the cameras aren't running. That's why Oprah Winfrey does not want to sit down publicly with me nor my husband to have a conversation because within minutes, the community would know who Oprah Winfrey really was because what she's not used to is anybody asking her any questions. I'm the deliverer. I'm the author, I'm the authority of all life and all beings, and I know it all. And someone would ask, well, how? Then when you have our, some of our black folk that go sit in front of a white man and speak ill of their people, I'm like, y'all, what are we doing? Whew. Man, Monique don't stop. She blames everybody. It's Oprah, it's Tyler, it's Lee Daniels, it's Netflix. Now it's Will Packer. She went too far when she started blaming Will Packer on shit. That's my friend. That's my homeboy. Will Packer's done more for black actors and actresses than just about anybody in the last 10 years. I mean, he has basically shown Hollywood that black movies have a mainstream market. I mean, Takers, Think Like a Man, Ride Along, Stomp the Yard, Girl Strip. I mean, the dude is basically changing the game, and now you're going to say he's against you. When, honestly, he put you in a movie almost Christmas when nobody was putting you in movies. And he stuck his neck out, and he went to bat for you. And then you throw him in under the bus. I'm not going to sit back and let you slander my friend's name like that. Will Packer is a good, good person. That's a good brother, man. He helped change my life. And I ain't going to sit back and let you slander his name, Monique. Sometimes you got to take accountability for yourself. It's you. It's you. What can you do to change things? Stop blaming everybody else for your shit, man. Come on, Monique. Shit's getting old. Oh, Monique keeps messing up, man. And I like Monique a lot, man. But goddamn, Mo, she's going after everybody, you know? I she went after Steve. Steve Harvey tried to help her out, you know, on his show. And then and the next day, she's throwing Steve Harvey under the bus. I knew Monique went too far when she started going after Oprah. I was like, ooh, some shit you got to keep to yourself, man. <laughs> you can't go after Oprah. Oprah starts making phone calls. You ain't working no more, bottom line, you know? <laughs> Because th here's the thing about the entertainment business, man. When, when you ain't in movies like you think or TV shows like you think, your brain starts playing tricks on you. You start thinking there's a conspiracy against me. You know, people don't like me anymore. When it's really not the case because you never know when your name's coming up behind closed doors for a movie or a TV show. Like, so when Monique went after Oprah, I said, God, Mo, don't do that because, you know, Oprah's got her own TV network, producing four or five movies a year. Monique didn't know what Oprah had coming up. Oprah might be getting ready to do The Color Purple 2. Sealy had a baby. <laughs> She was going to bring in Monique for Sealy had a baby. <laughs> but I was just, I was just looking at like, I was looking at all the people Monique started going after. So it was, so it's, so it's Tyler Perry, Lee Daniels, Steve Harvey, Oprah Winfrey, you know, uh, then she went, she knows she went after my, my buddy, Will Packer, the same guy that put me in Ride Along Think Like a Man is the exact same guy that put Monique in that Christmas movie a few years ago. And Monique tried to compare Will Packer movie producer to Harvey Weinstein movie producer. And I thought that was a little too far. So I went on my Instagram page and I did a video directed towards Monique, right? Now I never called Monique at her name, nothing like that. I just said, listen, Mo, when you got a lot of different problems with a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons, it might be you, you know? <laughs> And I'm not stupid. I knew when I did the video, I knew I was going to get some backlash, right? What I didn't know, I didn't know there was this thing out there called Black Twitter. I didn't know what the fuck Black Twitter was, right? All of a sudden, I do this video towards Monique, and man, Black Twitter's real. And they was in my ass for three days straight. If you don't know what Black Twitter is, if you say anything on social media that Black Twitter deems disrespectful to Black people or a Black person, they come after you. And I don't know how many people are on Black Twitter. I don't know if they have an office building with cubicles <laughs> or it's a group text that goes out. I don't know. All I know is I did this video towards Monique and for the next three days, every time I got on Twitter, it was over 100 mentions of my name and it was just Black Twitter down the line coming after me. And everybody was kind of saying the same thing just in their own way. 
You know, stay in your lane. This don't concern you. Leave black shit to black people. So Monique went on her uh, boycott of Netflix. Mm -hmm. Lots of people had a lot of, uh, you know, interesting things to say. But the Monique challenge that you did with Telemundo <laughs> and the language bias was one of the funniest things that I had seen yeah. this year. Right. Hands down. Hello, my loves. I would like all of you to join me on Boycott and Telemundo. Recently, I pitched a comedy special, and they said no due to racial, gender, and language bias. They said they're a Spanish-speaking network, and I don't speak Spanish, so they wouldn't give me a special. They've given Gabriel Iglesias a special, I think, and George Lopez. I've never heard him speak Spanish, like a few words, but it just goes to show the discrimination that's happening at Telemundo. Now, Grant, I don't know Spanish, but I want to be a trailblazer. Plus, I had the beginning and end of my special. Hola, hello, gracias, adios, thank you, good night. I just got to fill in the rest. I can learn Spanish, but the fact that they wouldn't even negotiate and give me a special lets me know that there is racial, gender, and language bias at Telemundo. So please join me in boycotting the Spanish-speaking network. Thank you. Gracias. I was bored. <laughs> I was in my hotel room. I was in Seattle, Washington. I was bored, and then I saw her. She said, hey, my loves, and did the racial and gender bias, and that's what comedians do. I was like this. I'm, I'm going I'm to make a funny one. And, you know, so there really wasn't much thought to it, but it, I thought it was funny. You said that they have a language bias because you don't speak Spanish. Right, I didn't get a special because I don't speak Spanish. Right. <laughs> Said, well, Monique said there was racial and gender bias. I said there's a language bias in Telemundo. And then I said they gave Gabriel Iglesias a special and George Lopez. I've never heard them speak Spanish. I've heard a few words. But <laughs> everybody know who he is. We sit in front of him and we just let this man say any and everything about us. And then we go right in with him. That Now, see, that to me is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And y'all babies that's good with this little computer, don't take my word. You can just go through the years of this cat just running his mouth. Mm -hmm. And it's like, stop doing that because what are we saying to the babies coming behind us? I had a little thing with Monique also. You know, I know you had the you little too? thing. Is that real? Monique. Oh, yeah, we did it. Well. I know you had the yeah, little thing. Yeah, I saw. He like, you yeah, too? Yeah, gang, yeah, gang, yeah. gang, gang, gang. Yeah. Well, I guess in my, my thing with, with Monique was it wasn't, um, first, I like Monique, right? We never had an issue with her, but when she she was going in on Tyler Perry and Oprah and everybody else. And then she went in on a buddy of mine, Will Packer, who's mm -hmm. put me in numerous movies. Uh, I was just like, uh, I just went, I went on okay. Instagram and I just, I didn't call her out her name or anything like that. I just said, hey, if you got a problem with a lot of people, it could be you. Yeah. At some point, I look in the mirror. And, uh, and so I, I knew I'd get some backlash, but. I mean, it just, I thought it needed to be said. Now, I had a meeting in David Talbot's trailer with Will Packer, David Talbot, and the first AD because they were being disrespectful to this black man. Mm. And I was not going to allow that to happen. Okay. I had a conversation with the first AD and I pulled him outside. I said, listen, brother, when it's your turn, I won't let nobody do it to you. But what I'm not going to do is stand by and watch you give a direction after the director gives us a direction. It confuses the cast and it's disrespectful. And to that black man's credit, his eyes filled up with water and he said, I appreciate you for having this conversation with me. OK, mm -hmm. so Will Packer and I are now at odds because I'm seeing how this brother's acting. I'm in my trailer. My assistant at the time, her name was Robin. Right. Mm -hmm. Robin is in her 50s. Mm -hmm. She's in my trailer with her shoes off. She's on the computer. Will Packer's friend or I'm not sure what title to give her. OK, mm -hmm. she comes into the trailer. Now, in this trailer, it is me, my hairstylist makeup artist and my assistant mm -hmm. this young lady who we're all old enough to be her mother mm -hmm. she comes and looks at my assistant and said what's your shoes doing off you and your trailer why do you care i said excuse me you're out of order you don't come in here questioning nobody in my trailer as a matter of fact and her energy was not that of, i'm playing it was what you i said as a matter of fact i need you to go get will because I'm not even going to have this conversation with you. I'm going to talk to your boss. 
When Will Packer comes into that trailer for us to talk, do you know what that man says to me and my hairstylist and my makeup artist and my assistant? I am the head nigga in charge. Everything stops with me. I said, well, I want to let you know this, Will. You're going to hear that you're the head nigga in charge from me as many times as I can tell people that's what you said. I said, and furthermore, you need to check your assistant because this is my space. We weren't in your trailer with our shoes off. We're in my space with our shoes off. But why would he come Why would he come to you with that type of energy? What, what, led, what led him to say that when all you ask his assistant to do was to go get him because she's questioning why That's people in your trailer have the truth. That's a good one. Because what I said to him was, who do we need to talk to? This young lady can't be up in here like that. And that's when he became the head nigga in charge. Uh, and then I said, who are you the head nigga in charge of? We have Danny Glover on this set. We have a legend and an icon. Are you the head nigga in charge of him? Are you the head nigga in charge of Kimberly Elise? Are you the head nigga in charge of Gabrielle Union? Are you the head nigga in charge of J.B. Smooth? Who are you the head nigga in charge of? So he tried to laugh it and joke it. I said, uh-uh. I don't play that way, brother. I said, the food is bad. Like, what we doing here? The food was slop. So when they say they didn't have any food, mm -hmm. the food we had, nobody ever ate that food because it was just like you can feed them anything. Mm -hmm. Now, here's where it gets even better. Remember how Taraji said the trailers were infested? Yes. Our trailers blew up. Wow. They blew up. Now, what I, whenever this airs, I'm going to post... The trail is blowing up so the people can see. Right. But they blew up. Oh, he probably will be sick. Anybody want to call me, man? He is attached to that dog. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Can you imagine if we was in that trailer? I know. It was bad, huh? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm trying to see which one is our trailer. And if any of us were in those trailers, we would have been gone. Right. The trailers blew up. Now, when I was smelling the gas, we went to the brothers that was hooking up the trailers and we said, hey, we smell gas. Mm -hmm. They said, Mo, we let him know, talking about the head nigga in charge, we let him know. He just said, okay, and walked <coughs> away. I said, he what? He just said, okay, and walked away. The trailers blew up. Did Will Packer reach out to anybody? I can't say he didn't reach out to me and say, hey, is everything okay? Did you lose anything in the and is everything good? The only thing they wanted to know from me was, where was Aunt May's wigs? Oh my God. Can you imagine if we was in that trailer? Oh my God. When I saw Taraji mm -hmm. broken mm -hmm. on those platforms, it was painful to watch. And I heard on the street, Taraji, you had the audacity to say you're thinking about getting, stopping acting. We said, stop talking. Hmm. Are you thinking about it? Um, mm. I'm just tired of working so hard, being gracious at what I do getting paid a fraction of the cost. Mm -hmm. I'm tired of hearing my sister say the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. um, you get tired. Mm -hmm. I hear people go, you work a lot. Yeah. Well, have to. Mm -hmm. The math ain't mathing. Mm -hmm. And when you start working a lot, you know, you have a team. Mm -hmm. Big bills come with what we do. Yes. We don't do this alone. The mm -hmm. fact that we're up is a whole entire team behind That's us. Right. Yes. They have to get paid. So when you hear someone saying, oh, such and such made $10 million. No, that's not that. That didn't make it to their account. Mm -hmm. Know that off the top, mm -hmm. Uncle Sam is getting 50%. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So do the math. Mm -hmm. Now we have 5 million. Mm -hmm. Your team is getting 30% or whatever your team is getting, off of what you grossed. Sometimes not more. after what Uncle Sam took. Now do the math. Mm -hmm. So 
I just I'm You're tired. I'm a, I'm only human and and mm -hmm. it seems every time I do something and I break another glass ceiling when it's time to renegotiate I'm at the bottom again mm -hmm. like I never mm -hmm. did what mm -hmm. I just did and I'm just mm -hmm. tired. tired. Yeah. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I get that. I get that. It wears on you, you know. Mm -hmm. Cuz what does that mean? Mm -hmm. What is that telling me? What is it telling me? Yeah. And what does it tell me? Mm. Yeah. You know? And if I can't fight for them coming up behind me, then what the fuck am I doing? I'm sorry. Yeah. Mm. yeah no, don't apologize. Don't apologize. I, I think it's an important message for people to hear because we see the lights, camera, action. Yep, yep, yep. And then and they tell so me glamorous. we don't yes. translate overseas. Yeah. 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 I'm tired of hearing that my entire career, 20 plus years in the game, and I hear the same thing, and I see what you do for another production, and when it's time for us to go to bed, you don't have any money. Mm. They play in your face. Mm -hmm. And I'm just supposed to smile and grin and bear it and just keep, like, mm -hmm. enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I have other things. I have my TPH brand. I have my mental wellness. I have other things because... This industry, if you let it, whew, it'll steal your soul. Yeah. But I refuse to let that happen. Yeah. However, Taraji and I had a conversation over a decade ago. Yes. In my trailer mm -hmm. when I was doing the Monique show. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, you got to keep on getting it until your turn comes. And I said, Taraji, most of us die before our turn comes. We got to ask for it right now. Now, I understand that because there was a time I felt the same way. Exactly. Because that's what I was told. Right. You just keep going and we'll get them the next time. We'll get them the next time. We'll get them the next time. And the next time never comes. And then you see our sister, broken, sitting on those platforms. Where's my raise? I haven't, had, I haven't seen a raise in my income since Proud Mary. And almost had to walk away from Color Purple. Because you know what? If I don't take a stand, how am I making it easy for Fantasia and Danielle and Halle and, and, and Felicia? Then what, why, why am I doing this? If it's all just for me, what the, why are you here? Now, when I said it, when I said it. Why didn't it get the traction when you said it that when she said it, now all of a sudden everybody is coming, and I and I don't have a problem. I'm mm -hmm. glad. Yes. But if you said this a decade ago, and I yes. remember you saying it over a decade ago, but um a while ago I had to come out and I spoke in reference to Netflix mm -hmm. that we had to boy. You know, I was asking folks to stand with us as we boycott Netflix for gender bias and color bias. Correct. And we were fighting for equality. Mm -hmm. And then I found out that I had become donkey of the day yes, mm -hmm. by Leonard. And I got to call you by your name, baby, because... Leonard. Leonard, yes. okay. <laughs> okay, baby, he's getting real special, Leonard. But we're going, okay, no, it, Leonard. It is Leonard, it is Leonard. And then I was called donkey of the day, and it really caught me off guard. Mm -hmm. Because when I met this brother some years ago, and I always go back to it because I met him in an elevator at Turner Station. And I met a young man that was full of humility and respect. Mm -hmm. And when I got on that elevator, he actually held the door. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yes, ma'am. And I said, oh, baby, thank you. And he was just like that. Yes, ma'am. And Miss Monique, it's a pleasure to meet you. And we had a very beautiful exchange. Mm -hmm. And I said to that brother, tell your mama that she raised you right. Mm -hmm. That's a and fact. And he said it was my mama and my grandmama. Yes, ma'am. So I felt like this was, and still is, a beautiful young brother making his way, but full of humility and respect. To we fast forward, and I become donkey of the day. So I didn't want to have it to be hearsay. I didn't want to have anybody exchange words that I may have said to him. So my husband and I wanted to come on so we could understand how I got titled donkey of the day. So why'd you give a donkey today, Charlamagne? Well, I think it was due to the Leonard. whole Netflix situation. You know, when I heard you say that, um, you know, you wanted us to boycott because of racial and gender bias, but then you went on to, you know, mention two brothers. And a woman. So I said maybe she should be more specific and say black woman gender bias. But then also just from a business aspect, I wanted to know why did you feel like, you know, you should have gotten whatever Chris Rock got, whatever Dave Chappelle got, or whatever Amy Schumer got. Because I feel like this is a what are you doing for me right now type of industry. Well, she didn't say what they got. She said she should have got more than she was offered. And then Charlamagne, you brought up an old Netflix special. Mm-hmm. 
as well. Well, that was later on. But mm-hmm. my, my, my point was, like, you know, this is a what are you doing for me right now kind of industry. We all know Monique is a legend, but we also know that those things, those deals that Netflix are giving out are based off recent uh, stand-up shows, recent shows, recent concerts, recent arenas, recent tours like that. So I just wanted to know why you felt like you deserved that much. Well, Daddy, would you like to start or would you like for me? Whichever you prefer. But, you know, if, if we're going to go back to the conversation uh, that we had with Robbie, it didn't start with the offer where the color bias and the disrespect transpired. It started from when we had our initial conversation after Monique got her reviews from the nights in which uh, Benjamin and Caitlin, who were representatives for Netflix, came out to see Monique, in which on two different nights they uh, saw her get a standing ovation, which subsequently gave them reviews of amazing and, and great show. So when we're in the midst of having the conversation prior to them giving the, um, the, the, the offer, we're in the midst, and he says, well, I want to make it very clear that, you know, people speak about Dave Chappelle, Amy Schumer, and what they got. I want to just make it clear, you know, so we can manage uh, expectations that everybody doesn't get those type of deal. Well, when we're in the midst of that conversation, the phone disconnects. We never reconvene. He never gets us back on. And our attorney looks, calls me up, and we speak, and we're like, well, that was strange. Are we going to get back on the phone or not? Because anybody who does business knows that this is the key time in which to build the value of your client. Mm. Then we came back with an offer that they allegedly had sent over that our attorney and I had never received. And then on that, it was a certain time limit in which we were supposed to respond. Well, we had passed the time limit because we never received it. When our attorney had asked them to uh, please resend the offer that they had allegedly sent, it was clear that it had never been sent in the first place. Hey, my sweet babies, I'm Monique. And I'm Sydney. And we're coming to y'all today to let you know we're standing with all the unions that are striking right now. And we have a story that we must share of our own with the community. Countess Vaughn and I did a show called The Parkers. The Parkers has now been on air for 24 years, and they're trying to convince us through our ownership of the show that we made absolutely no money. And it's baffling being that when you have a conversation with the executive producers and they allude to the fact that the show in its entirety, five years, was made for under $70 million. It went out of production in 2004, but by 2009, we see profit participation statements that show the program made over $700 million, but yet was in a close to a billion, if not a billion dollar deficit. So what we're asking you, CBS, is can you please treat these two black women fairly? When our brother Dave Chappelle, who ironically had a deal with CBS, said he signed a deal out of desperation and it was a bad deal, they were able to go back and do the right thing and they made that deal fair, and they paid Dave Chappelle what he rightfully deserved. What we're asking you, CBS, don't pay us any more, but don't pay us any less. And the reason why we're having this conversation out loud for the community to hear is this. We see the numbers, and they still don't want to pay. What will happen to you when you don't even know the numbers exist? So we're asking you, And when we say community, we mean community as in the ones that's fighting for equality. Will you stand with us? CBS, will you treat us fairly? We love y'all for real, my babies. Why didn't it get the traction? Why didn't it get the support? Why wasn't it propped up when Monique said it? I think there's a few reasons why. Number one, it was the messenger. I should just be grateful I got invited to the party. You a big, fat black woman. How dare you be the one? And then on top of that, you're saying names. You're saying Oprah's name out loud. You're saying Tyler's name out loud. You're saying Lee's name out loud. You're saying Lionsgate out loud. That's not what we do. We say they. We say the people. We say the studio. We say the producers. How dare you actually say our heroes' names? You're very specific. These are our heroes. How could you say their names out loud? Because they're the ones that did it. And if I don't say it out loud, now you see a woman that is swallowing that pain, that is so stressed out, 
Then you see our sister Taraji B. Henson sit on that platform. And I love that baby because she's a beautiful spirit. Mm -hmm. But to see her that broken, what our community was saying was we have a hard time. Some of us, we have a hard time seeing a strong black woman with a back straight and a chin up and a strong black man standing by her side. We have a hard time accepting that. But we can accept seeing a black woman broken. Now it's really serious because she's falling apart. Pay in any industry in some ways is very subjective. I, I can only imagine in Hollywood it's even more so. What do you think is the reason that, you know, Hollywood executives get away with paying someone like Taraji less and not giving her a raise movie to movie, role to role? Well, you know, systemic racism is a part of everything that happens in this nation. But beyond that, I think that there's this thing where they pit people against each other, where the idea is, well, you know, if you don't want to do it, we'll get somebody else to do it. And somebody's rent may be due. And so they may take the lesser amount. And and we are we are lesser as a as a as an industry because we don't get to have the brilliance of someone as Taraji because they don't want to pay them what they're worth. And it's a fight that, you know, white actors don't have and white female actors don't have. And what she said that really resonated with me, Abby, was when she said, even if she fights and gets what she needs for this particular film, she has to start all over again the next time she gets a film. Tyler Perry called us up, right? And he said, I can see the pain in you and I can hear it. And I want to let you know that I, I, I would never do nothing to hurt you. But the conversation kept going on only for Tyler Perry to admit he did start a rumor that I was difficult to work with. He lied only for Tyler Perry to admit I was wrong. And when my movie Boo come out, I'm going to say that. Right now, here's where. When you did that interview with Kat, I could respect how you do it. Because Kat said, you let them people lie in your face. And your response was, Kat, I don't know if they're lying or not. Right. Because I can only take them at their word. At their word. Right? Yes. Well, we sent you the audio mm -hmm. of Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to take me at my word. I want you to hear his word. He is saying, wait a minute, hold up. We don't know this sister to be no bullshit. We know she a loud mouth. We know she will say some shit off the wall. But what we know about it is she true to a word. And all I would ask you is one que two questions. The first question is, did you not just say it was wrong? Tyler. Did you not just say it was wrong, Tyler? To say she was difficult for not doing something that she was not contractually obligated to do? Did you not say that you would feel that that was wrong? Or am I missing something? I, 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 I absolutely said that. Yeah. So the question I would say is... Okay, is there a number? You know, taking that back to them was just a huge problem, okay? And I'm going to take a couple things a minute, because I just watched your, your podcast, and it, it, really, it really broke my heart, because number one, I feel you. I feel I feel the sadness that, that's from you in all of this. And I don't want you to feel that, I mean, especially for me. I can't speak for anybody else. But for me, I, I'm not anyone that wants to hurt or offend anybody, especially you. I think you are brilliantly talented. I think you should have a lot more happening than you from that award. I thought for sure that if you had campaigned and wanted and played by their rules, what would happen is in the next deal, you would have got more money, millions of dollars, and your career in the film would have been much different. I believe that much in your talent. So, so in, in saying all of that, in saying all of that, I just, I just say it's just, it's just heartbreaking because I don't ever want you to think that I'm not black, trying to blackball or say anything. But please give me what I say. This. I'm not trying to hurt you. I will never try to hurt you. If Monique asked Lionsgate for a favor and they told her no, and they asking, she's asking for a favor that is not contractual, not something that they're contractually obligated to do, and they told her no. But then she went and told the world how difficult that they were. Do you think that that would be fair or unfair? No, that's not fair. It's not fair. No, so, so, so the question, so pardon, pardon me. So the question I would ask of you, good sir, because I appreciate you being honest enough to answer that with a relative quickness. I really do. So the question that I would ask you is this. 
if we should do unto others as we would have them do unto ourselves, the question I would ask is, how do you sit back or how would you feel if someone said about you that you were difficult to work with because you didn't want to perform for them a function that you were not contractually able or obligated to do? How would you feel about that? Well, as I said, that's not fair. If I bring a movie, if I bring a movie to, for Monique over there, I'm going to have to say it. I'm going to have to defend it. I'm going to have to fight for it. Well, it's easy. It. It's easy because all you would be doing is telling the truth. You are six foot six black man. Come okay? on. Mo you, you, you. I, ain't got, listen, I ain't got no problem, man. I ain't got no problem. Trust me when I tell you. I ain't got no problem. Well, that's why we saying then. Th then say it now. Say it now. Say it now. I'm black and I'm proud. Come on. James Brown is counting. I'm saying it now. I'm a, I'm, I will let all of this fool off when I get back out on the press tour to promote my next thing. I know it's going to come up. <laughs> That's when I will talk about it. But, 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 no, 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 it's too hot. It's too hot. Y'all eat it up. You know you're not supposed to be recording people. No, no. No, no. Let me back up. Okay. Everything we did was legal. And here's where a black woman really gets the kick in the ass. Had I not recorded Tyler Perry, then it would have been my word, word against, his. against his. And then on top of that, it would have been, he's so powerful, we can't even pay no attention to that. Right. Well, now I have him on audio, which is legal to do mm -hmm. where we live. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have him on audio. And do you know what some people then said? Why well, would you record him? <laughs> Just like you sat there and said, you know what's illegal to, but did you hear what the man said? I, I violated you. Yeah. I mistreated you. Yeah. Do you know, Shannon, that's cost my family tens of millions of dollars? Yeah. Over a lie and a rumor? After that came out, then you were on this whole situation with Oprah and Tyler. Everyone's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> What happened, Monique? What happened? I did a movie called Precious. Uh-huh, I loved it. I signed up for that movie with my friend named Lee Daniels. He said, it's paying $50,000. I said, let's do it, because it was an independent film, mm -hmm. okay? When we did the contract, he said, you have 5% of the film. We're not looking for nothing. We know this is a small, independent film. The film goes to Sundance and it begins to get all of this praise. Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey get involved with Precious. Okay. They become executive producers. That's wonderful, because you know when they put their name to it, here you go, it's get ready to mm -hmm. go through the roof. So when it came time for the campaigning of this award for the Oscar, and when it came time to go to different festivals and, and promote this movie, mm -hmm. but you're really campaigning for the awards. Well, I was in a position, I had the Monique show, I was doing the Queens of Comedy tour, I had little babies, and my third husband. So what I was not gonna do was make Hollywood the priority. I've already done the movie. I don't need to campaign for you now to say, I want this trophy, I've done the movie, I've done my part. I get a call from Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey says, I will send my private jet to come get you and bring you to, I want to say, it was one of the festivals. And I said, sis, I'm in the bed with my man and my babies eating chips, watching Curious George. Tell him I said, I appreciate it and I love him, but I'm not going to be able to make that one. About 10 minutes later, I get a call back from Lee Daniels. Lee Daniels said, I told you you didn't care about this. I told that. I told her you ain't care nothing about this. And it's not that I don't care nothing about it. It's just that my priorities wasn't that. I've already done my part, okay? The Hoodie Awards come up with Steve Harvey. Mm -hmm. Tyler Perry is there. Mm -hmm. Tyler Perry calls me into his room. He has a staff of people there. He does like this, and everybody disperses. Oh, wait a minute. Do it again, Monique. Oh. And everybody disperses except for my security. I said, you don't work for Tyler Perry. 
So everything I'm saying, there's has always been someone else there to hear what's happened. So we're sitting there and Tyler says to me, listen, you may want to campaign for this because if you get nominated, your next film will be three to five million dollars. If you win it, your next film is five to eight million dollars. I said, Tyler, look at me. I'm a black woman. Where they do that at? Those aren't the, sal the salaries that we're going to get. He said, oh, no, no, no. If you just campaign, I'm telling you right now. I said, Tyler, I cannot do a song and dance. I have no contract with Lionsgate. I have no contract with you, with Oprah. The only person I had a contract with was Lee Daniels. Right. And I fulfilled my contract. Mm. Now, if anybody else wants me to do anything else, there's a price to that because what we're not in is slavery. So what I cannot do is work for y'all for free. So Tyler Perry says, well, I think outside the box and I'm not scared of them white boys. So, you know, I'm just trying to tell you for your own good. Well, if you think outside the box, and you're not scared of those white boys, why are you trying to tell me to do something that I'm not contractually obligated to do? Okay. I never worked with Tyler Perry. Okay. Um, the way that that relationship came about okay. was, firstly, Daniel was making the call because he was mad. Because <laughs> he thought Tyler Perry and Oprah Winfrey was trying to steal his movie from him. So those were the first phone calls I was getting, baby, and he was reading them for life, okay? Calling them all things, all the things, right? So then Tyler Perry and I had a conversation at the Hoodie Award. At the time it was called the Hoodie Award, when they were trying to get me to go do all of this press internationally. And for those that don't know, who put on that Hoodie Award? Steve Harvey put on the Hoodie Awards in Vegas, right? So, it just makes me smile the way this whole scene went down. So I'm beckoned to go into Tyler Perry's dressing room, okay. right? I'm beckoned. So I go into Tyler Perry's dressing room, and there are about maybe 25 people on Tyler Perry's team. And he does this. Like that? Okay. And everyone leaves. Well, I have my security with me. And I looked at my security and like, you don't work for Tyler Perry. So my security stayed in the room. So Tyler Perry says to me, listen, you may really wanna consider promoting this film because if you get nominated for an Oscar award, your next film is three to $5 million. And if you win it, your next film is six to $8 million. I said, Tyler, who are you talking to? I'm a black woman. Where do they pay those type of salaries, brother? I said, what I cannot do, Tyler, is work for free. I've done what I was supposed to do. I cannot go overseas and do this for free, Tyler. So then he goes on about his spill, you know. I said, well, listen, you can write me the check for me to go overseas. I don't care where the money comes from, but I'm not gonna do it for free. He says, well, I don't believe in giving money away for free. I said, I don't believe in working for free, so we're on the same page. And then fast forward. Fast forward. Things, you know, everything kind of comes out with Lee, Oprah, and there's an audio conversation that you guys had with Tyler. I got a call on my cell, and her and I would just so happen to be standing together and that's when he called me and looking for Monique to say, hey, I'd like to speak with y'all because I heard your podcast, I could hear the hurt, and you heard the audio. What have I taken from Oprah? When did I have Oprah's mother and father on my show? Mm -hmm. When did I have anybody come and speak about Oprah Winfrey on the Monique show? That's never happened, so how could she feel that Would way? you have done that? Had her family on? Yeah. Let me tell you how we operate. When we had the Monique show, there was a comedian on there. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to joke T.I.'s wife, Tiny. Mm -hmm. My husband walked out in the middle of his set. He said, cut. He said, brother, we don't do that here. We uplift our folks. Mm -hmm. We don't play that. So no, I would not have done that. When Oprah Winfrey had my family, and, and, and I'll, I'll tell y'all, and I'm looking, over, I'm looking around, baby, because there are people here. Yes. Okay, and I don't yeah. want to be rude to the people at Shay Shay's club. You got other people in the club, mm -hmm. right? When Oprah Winfrey called me up 
And she said, I got a call from your brother. And this is after I won the Oscar Award, mm -hmm. right? And your brother wants to come on the show. And he wants to apologize to you for molesting you. And he wants to tell other people how to look out for a predator. Right. I said, Oprah, I said, I don't want anything to do with that cat. I said, but, and then she said, well, if you want me to scratch the show, I will scratch it. I said, sis, don't scratch it because he could be a different person. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get in the way if that cat is a different person. I just don't want no parts of it. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I hung up that phone, Shannon, I was like, I appreciate that sister. Like she didn't have to call me. She didn't. She didn't have to call me and say, no. I'm going to have your brother. Right. I start seeing commercials with my mother and my father and my other brother who used to be my manager, mm -hmm. who knew the fear that I had with the brother that was up on stage, right? right? On Monday's Oprah show, Monique's older brother, Gerald, comes clean about sexually abusing his sister. Why do you want to be here today, Gerald? I'm here today to first acknowledge what I've been in denial for for 37 years. And that is, I did assault, uh, inappropriately touch my sister in manners that were not comfortable for her. And for that, I apologize and I'm humbly sorry. Two years ago, Monique revealed she had been molested by her brother and used that pain to give her Oscar-winning performance in Precious. Some may think that you're only doing this to get into the good graces of your sister now because she has an Academy Award. Mm -hmm. Now, that's, I'm doing this to apologize to my sister, to hopefully bring back some family unity. As for their relationship now, Monique recently told Barbara Walters there is none. Did your brother ever apologize to you? The apology that I got from my brother is if you think I did something wrong, then I'm sorry. They were my exact words to my sister. Well, there's no more if you think I did it. You were absolutely right with what you said. I did it. I'm not proud of it. Monique, I'm sorry. We never talked about my mother being there. She never told you that. You know how you feel about your grandparents? Yes, absolutely. You know the honor and the, how you speak about them? Mm-hmm. Imagine. You then seeing your granddaddy and your grandmama on a show and they're talking about somebody that violated you. And that woman didn't tell you that they were going to be there. How would you feel? I would feel like you feel like you felt betrayed. That is exactly how I felt and how I feel. And it's not, oh, I'm in a no, I understand it. But you portrayed me, sister, and I'm not the only one. Because at the time when she called you, she said it was just your brother. Just my brother. And when my mother was on that show, do you know what I had to deal with, Shannon? What's that? I would be in the store, and I would have elderly women coming up to me, and they would say, your mama ain't shit. Wow. Now, they wasn't lying, Shannon, okay? <laughs> they wasn't lying, baby. Sometimes you got to let the truth be the goddamn truth. Sometimes you got to just go with it. But still, it's my mother. It's your mom. And I'm in here and I, because when she went, I'm having to defend something. And I got that often with them telling me what my mother wasn't because you did not tell me. Had Oprah Winfrey said, I'm going to have your mama, I'd have said, shut that shit down. It. I don't need nobody seeing my mama be greedy. I don't need the world seeing. Shut it down. Now, there's a white woman named Barbara Walters. Mm -hmm. They called her first. And she said, Monique, I told your family, I can't do that to you. Well, Atlanta's a good place to raise your two little boys, isn't it? Atlanta is an amazing place. I should warn you that parts of her story are disturbing. And if you have very young children, you may find some of this inappropriate. What would winning an Oscar mean to you? It's a great accomplishment. And it's that kid in the bathroom mirror with the bathrobe and the bath towel wrapped around me with the brush in my hand, saying, I would like to thank. It's that same Did you do girl. that when you were yes. a little kid? You were already thanking people for yeah, a Baby, I did that. I signed autographs because, <laughs> and people say to me, well, did you think that this would ever happen? And my response is yes, because if I didn't think it, why get in the game? You know, there has been that backlash 
of some critics saying that this movie is, is uh, uh, makes black people look bad, mm -hmm. this terrible, abusive family. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? I say that this terrible, abusive family is colorless. We were just the people that were chosen to be Precious and Mary Jones. But Precious and Mary Jones is every color, every gender, it's, it's universal. You've said that you understood Mary Jones. Yes. What did What did you understand? See, I knew Mary Jones. Mary Jones was my oldest brother. I want to go to that. Okay. Because you went to a very dark place to play this. Mm -hmm. And you said that your older brother, what, 10 years older than you? Mm -hmm. Your older brother you described as a monster. Mm -hmm. And he abused you. Yes. From the time you were... Seven. Seven. How did he abuse you? Are we talking about sexual abuse? Yes. Sexual abuse can be someone touching your breasts, someone rubbing your vagina, someone rubbing your behind, someone rubbing up against you with their private parts. So for me to go into detail... Okay, but did he do all that? Yes. Why didn't you tell your parents? I think for the same reason most people don't tell. You're afraid. I was afraid of my brother. At what point did you tell your parents? I was 15 when I told. Did they believe you? Yes. Did they do anything to him? In the moment, he was asked to leave. And that was pretty much it. The movie, The Butler, mm -hmm. that movie was offered to me. Mr. Strong uh, tweeted out to the world, setting the record straight, Monique was never offered The Butler or Empire. I tweeted that brother back and I said, Mr. Strong, will you speak as loudly when you realize that you're wrong? Now, I have no animosity towards either one of those brothers and I understand what Mr. Strong is doing. He's defending his friend. And if his friend says to him, that did not happen, He's being a friend and a great business partner. I want you to clear up something because I just saw something. Okay. Um, that was shared with me and I saw it. I know this is to be true. There is a script of the butler sent to you mm -hmm. and to Sydney from Lee Daniels management. It came from his office. It is a script of the butler. Yes. Yet in all of the social media and the post and the back and forth, they are saying that that never happened that you were never offered a part in empire or the butler but i just saw yes. the script from the butler from lee daniels team to your team so something as my grandmother would say may she rest in peace there's a fly in the milk here sydney i think keith sweat said it best something 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 just ain't right you better know those lyrics hey, okay that's what i do <laughs> so let's talk about um the empire and Taraji, and, you know, people are saying, well, she wasn't off of that part either. Yes. You know, the one thing that I want to say in reference to my sister, our sister, Taraji P. Henson, Cookie Lines was meant for that sister. Mm -hmm. No one else could play that role the way she is playing that role. And we're saying, please keep supporting that entire cast of Empire because what they're doing is amazing. They're breaking records. And when people wanted to make this a uh, Monique versus Taraji, mm. that's not what wow. this is by no means because that's our sister. Right. And we're supportive and cheerleading her on. However, this has nothing to do with that. So we wanted to clear it up. Guys, this is not me saying, oh, I'm mad with Taraji or Taraji has a problem with me. By no means. Me and that sister ain't doing nothing but hugging each other with our arms wrapped around each other saying, baby, go get yours. Go do it. With the butler, you just saw that script. I saw the script. Now, you don't normally get scripts just to read a script just to read it. Mm. I was off at the part of Gloria. With Empire, and as Sydney said, more to come, I was offered the part of Cookie. Now, I don't have an issue with Mr. Daniel saying, you know what? They want to go with Taraji. Right. No problem. But the way that played out is a problem. And now to be saying Monique was never a thought. We never even wanted to hire Monique for this. Well, again, 
when you're st- when you start seeing the communications that went back and forth, mm-hmm. what I have said publicly, and I'll say it now to Mr. Daniels and to Mr. Strong, and with Mr. Strong, who's actually making the statements, this I was is never his offered. Tweet, Danny Strong, Monique was never offered roles in Empire or the Butler. Hashtag setting the record straight at Lee Daniels sent. And I appreciate him saying that because Mr. Strong, from his perspective could be telling the truth Mm -hmm. because he's not on any of the communications. This is the first time I've heard of Mr. Strong. (laughs) So Mr. Strong could be really thinking that if me, he and Lee talked and Lee says, well, I've never sent her anything. He's supporting his friend and his business partner. And we get down for people like that that say, I'm going to take a stand with my friend. But as I've said to Mr. Strong, will you speak as loudly when you find out? that those things aren't true and I was offered those things and I'm not just pulling it out the air Mm -hmm. because what they're doing is they're putting my character in question and they're putting my reputation in question as if now I'm this I'm just screaming and saying oh look at what happened by no means I'm not angry with anybody I understand the game however what I can't let you do is go out and speak things that you know not to be true, especially when Mr. Daniel says Monique is difficult. And I'm like, Lee, when have you and I ever had a difficult moment? What does that mean to you when someone says you're difficult? Lee Daniels came out and said, I did offer Monique the butler. It took me a long time to realize. I am so sorry for hurting you in any way that I do. But as he said to me, he said, Mo, at the time I didn't have no power and I didn't have no money. So when Oprah said she wanted it, so who played the lead role in The Butler? Oprah Winfrey. Lee Daines was getting ready to do a biopic on Richard Pryor and he offered me the grandmother. Who then calls Lee Daniels and says, I want to be the grandmother. So as you're looking at me, it's the same way I'm looking at that sister. And I'm saying, why don't we sit down and have a conversation? Because the way things could look, it may not be that way, but just the way things look, Oprah. Just the way you would have my family on your show, Oprah. I'm going to bring this up. I wasn't going to do it. But damn it, this is, this seat, tell I say, you might want to have another look, example. This seat make you go, truth, tell it. No, tell the damn truth. Tell them to tell the truth. Because family is sacred. It's supposed to be. And we don't cross the line with family. Mm-hmm. And people begin to get comfortable to jump on the Monique bandwagon of Monique doing things wrong. And she doing this and she doing that. And there's a brother named D.L. Hughley. Yeah. And until he take accountability, I won't let it go. What? Because. What was you going to say? I was going to say, what did D.L. do? Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Baby, that voice went up, didn't it? D.L. is friend. He like, that's my friend. No, I, I, I've met D.L. on several occasions. Mm-hmm. I don't know D.L. like that. Okay. Do, I, do I know D.L. say like I know an earthquake? No. Do I know, uh, since I've interviewed Kat, had several conversations with him, do I know DL on that level? No. Right. See, when we say family is sacred, right. family is sacred. And we know that you don't cross the line when it comes to family. Correct. Right? I do DL's t- uh, radio show. Yes. DL Hughley is not there. His team is there. Mm-hmm. And Shannon, we having a great time. I mean, baby, we having a great time. We going forward, back and forth. When we get to the end of the show... They said, Monique, you want to play a game? Well, I want to play. I said, sure, Shaka. Let's play a game. And it's a game called Would You Rather. Oh. Okay? Now. Monique, you already, you should have said, I'm too old for this game. Wait a minute. We're having fun, baby. <laughs> right? We're having a good time, okay, Shannon. Okay. okay. We, I mean, it's the sister there and it's two other guys. We're having a great time. It's okay. a beautiful black unity cookout. Okay. We're having a good time. Okay. Would you say your wife was your family? Is that considered family? Yeah. So your husband is considered family, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. So here we go. They said, Monique, we want to play a game of would you rather. Let's go. Would you rather your husband sleep with Lee Daniels with a condom 
or Corinne Steffens without one. Really, Monique? Now, as y'all are watching right now who haven't heard this story, y'all going, huh? they doing the same thing in the studio. They going, huh? okay. That is exactly what happened. Now, I said to the team, how does that uplift our community? I said, sister, and her name is Jasmine, how could you ask another sister that? Well, we just planned, I said, tell me the joke in that because I don't know what you're insinuating. Then you're involving people that have nothing to do with nothing. Like, what are y'all doing? So I said, I'm going to call my brother. DL, I'm going to call my brother. I call DL Hughley on the phone. I say, hey, baby. Yeah. Huh? That's how he responds. Yeah. Did he know it was you? Yes, he, because they called him to let him know Monique's going to be calling. Right. Like, this, it was getting crazy. Right. I'm like, just let me get on the phone with my brother, right? Yeah. Hey, DL, yeah. I said, listen, I just got off the phone with your team, and they wanted to play this game, would you rather? And it was, like, stupid. Like, asking me about my husband and Lee Daniels and Corinne Steffens, and his exact words, well, that's how we do it. I said, DL, how does that uplift our community? And again, I don't know what y'all trying to insinuate, but brother, what you doing? All right. I, I, I'm taking time to respond to Monique again. She made another greasy ass video with her daddy. Um, we kind of relitigating some of the stuff she said on Club Shay Shay, where she talked about how she was on the show and somebody, you know, they played a game. Would you rather? And I guess she felt like they insulted her husband's sexuality, which is interesting because she can always talk shit about everybody else's sexuality. But I guess her husband's sex was like, he's off limit. But a hit dog will bark unless his mouth is full. But she talked about, well, she didn't actually call her lawyer. Who the fuck would be afraid of your lawyer? Your lawyer, you mean the lawyer that did your contract? The law, That lawyer, the lawyer from the firm of Negro, 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 from Ghetto, Got Him and Gone, that lawyer? Who the fuck afraid of him? He couldn't get your name right on a ticket. He gonna get it right on a, on a legal document. It didn't happen because we decided it shouldn't happen. We didn't, you didn't need to, because we respect people. We don't have to do things for, t for, for clicks. They took it off because you asked me to, because I respected you at the time. You also talked about how I um, disrespect you on so many platforms, uh, but you have yet, you have this impeccable memory where you can tell to the degree, well, who did what to you and why and what happened, where you were, but you can't pull up one time on any platform that I said anything about you at all because you know you're lying. You got that piece of paper and that big ass memory, but you can't pull one up. My biggest mistake is saying yes to you. I should have said no when you came on my, you couldn't come on my radio show. I should have said no that I wasn't playing those dates with you. As a matter of fact, I would, almost anybody who says yes to you at some point is, is, is in this mail you with you. Almost anybody. So I would suggest anybody out there, you can say yes to drugs, but say no to Monique. You talked about how um, you, my children, families are off limits. They weren't when you were running across Vegas. I mean, on the stage in Detroit, they weren't when you talking shit on social media. When you got your ass whipped and your tickets dropped, then they became off limits. But let's do this. Let's decide that you will treat my children like you treat yours, like you don't know them, invisible, like you have no relationship with them, like you're estranged, you're, like you're unfamiliar, like you don't know them. You also intimated that I was a coward. You know what I'd never do? I would never let my woman take care of me. I would never let my woman get evicted from her apartment. I would never let my woman has to ask another man for money. I'd never do that. Can your old man say the same? He loves you. Of course, he got to say that. You claim him on your taxes. He's a dependent. He's sitting there with you right now. Uh-huh and everything. Because it ain't like he does anything else. But you never address the salient point. I said that if you spent as much time writing your Netflix special... As you did, arguing about getting it, it wouldn't have been trash. It was. I didn't say it. I defy anybody out there. Stop listening to me. Watch it. Read the reviews. Read the reviews. You beg for something. You made valid points that women are underpaid, that they're not valued. That's absolutely right. So you would think that when you got a chance to do something that you would argue for, you'd be up for the challenge, but you shit the bed because you never are ready for it because all you ever do is complain about what you don't have. You're never ready for the moment because you're always living in the past. I said it. You, if you spend half of your time doing, as opposed to talking about who didn't do for you and what they did for you, you'd be a lot further along. You wouldn't be evicted.
You wouldn't be working for your man. You wouldn't be asking other comics for money. So you got all the ingredients. Take that piece of paper that you're running down the list with and that pen that you got and that daddy six next to you, daddy sitting next to you and do what you can't do do what you never do. Write a fucking joke. When I watched DL say she went after my wife, she went after my daughters. I want to really be clear who I went after so that there's no confusion here. When I was on stage, when I'm on stage and we are performers, we are performing to the audience in front of us. When I was on that stage and I said, it must be hard to perform oral sex. But differently. Okay. On a coward. That had nothing to do with Mrs. Hughley. That insult was directed straight to you, DL. That had nothing to do with your wife. That was straight to you. So it felt like you were trying to pass it off as if I was going after your wife. When it comes to your daughter, to the baby that you did a post about, you did an interview about, I didn't do that interview. Man touched my child, which nothing could be further from the truth. They were both 13 years old. They were, boy, they were, they were friends that had grown up together. And, and this is something I lament to this day, denied that she, I said, well, you know, that's what kids do. And I, I will never forgive myself for not A, believing her and, and B, handling it the way I did. I simply reposted what you said. So when you say, Monique, you went after my daughter, that's untrue, DL. I posted what you said. And then when you said on, on your when you were really going for it with your shades on and you said, Monique said, I stood by and watched my daughter be raped. D.L. Hughley, that's your conscience talking to you, brother. I never said that. I never said that. And I want to be a little clear about something else. Never would I try to do anything to harm any of your babies because we got babies too. So never would I try to do anything to harm your children. However, what I was saying to your daughter and to the other daughters out there, I know what it's like for your daddy to know you've been touched and he not protect you because my daddy did the same thing. That, that's what that whole point was. But I was showing why I would call you a coward, brother. I don't think it's brave that you didn't protect your baby. So when I said what I was saying, let me be clear to you, D.L. Hughley, it had nothing to do in reference to your family, and you know that. Now, when you were speaking and you were going off and you said, um, uh, what did he say? She was so offended by the game we play, but you didn't say what the offense was. And that's the part for me that is disheartening that you continue to try to trick and smoke and mirror our people. If you're going to say it, say it all the way through. When you say family is sacred, you are absolutely right, baby. You're right. But when you say would my husband rather and you co-sign your team of people doing that, well, isn't my husband sacred? So you got to be careful in your words because the very words you use, DL, they're going to come back and they're coming back to bite you, baby. And what I also said on Club Shay Shay, when I looked in that camera, I said, DL, I love you, brother. And I don't know if you didn't hear that part, but we really do. We love you, brother. And if ever you get courageous enough, to want to have a conversation, we're always open to it because doing that, it shows how our community can get better. When you're wrong, as we have said to you, hey, brother, we apologize on that one. Yeah, incorrect on the cease and desist. And I want to add one more thing. When you spoke in reference to your daughter being a reason why Monique stopped speaking about it, what you don't even understand out of love for you out of love for you. See, you can have a problem with your brother, but you're not going to take it out on the kids. And we respected the fact that she tried to defend you, but we got three big ass sons. 
that if we were to think about it in the same way that she thought about it, what would that be? But out of love for you, we're not going to go after your child trying to protect the father that she loves. But one could argue based upon what you said about yourself, had you exhibited the same type of love and protection for your other daughter that your other daughter tried to exhibit towards you, there never been, would have been the commentary that you made about yourself. And I liken it to Brother Corey Holcomb, who I don't know, but I got a lot of respect for him because I heard him say something in an interview. He spoke about how Earthquake Son had came to one of his shows and the young man was hesitant about introducing himself or reintroducing himself because of the rift between his father and himself. And Brother Corb was like, come on, man. No, 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 no. You come over here and I'm going to give you love because that was between your father and I. And it made him reconsider the whole thing and reach back out to an old friend. In my humble opinion, that's what real men do. We come from the old school. We're not going to have no problem with your children because we love them and we love you and we want y'all to win. Not at the expense of the community, though, being demeaned in order to get followers. But for the, from the standpoint of if we come together, if we come together, we're going to win just by default. So I woke up this morning uh, with a very disturbing message on my phone from, um, it seems as though one of my baby daddies has a little problem. I did also want to come on here and say that a lot, like I can't, between a lot of people who are close to him and who have experienced how he is, I mean, just lashed out at anyone he can and completely change the person that he is a lot of us feel like maybe something is wrong like mentally i don't know it, he's older i bipolar i don't know but he has completely changed i will come on here and talk about whatever i want because it's my life and i'm the one suffering so he has completely changed the couple texts I just had, those are only the beginning. I'm going to go through them if he's going to... I don't want to post a ton. But if he tries to say that, like, it's not happening, I will... I have screen recordings. I have voice memos of things that you... It doesn't sound like a human being. He's, like, shrieking and yelling. And, I mean, he sounds, like, possessed. So, I will say... I'm not even sure if it's, like, to his credit. But the best explanation I have is something mental going on because I used to be very close to my dad he used to be a good co-parent close with my mom my stepdad he was his godfather to my little brothers we all went on vacation together every year like very close well well after the divorce everyone was really happy when he had business ventures my mom would invest in them like good friends he'd come stay with us like we'd come stay there we don't like all the time everyone together and then really he suddenly just decided that like if we don't agree, it's oh you're all bitches like your mother, I hate you, all these fucking bitches are the same. Oh my I mean he's just a different person. looked to me in the eye and I've been like I need help I, w I was in Greece doing the camp and I was like you cut off my debit card I only got like a hundred couple hundred dollars a month as a minor and I was like I'm in a foreign country and my debit card won't work I can't even add money to it can you help me and he was just like no I, I sure hope that you don't die on the streets of, of Thessaloniki and I was like no no like I'm really stranded out here um I need help and he's like well, I sh maybe you should ask your mother not to sue me. And I'm like, you're suing her. And he's like, well, maybe when you bitches decide you're going to like be reasonable, 
I'll help you. And I'm like, this is unsafe. It's nighttime. I like, what? You cut me off out of nowhere. And he did it like on purpose. He was like, oh, enjoy camp. I put some, like, you're good to go. I put money in your car. And then he cut it off when I landed. So I'd be stranded. My mom helped me. It was fun. Worst things have happened. I'm just saying he'll like look me in the eye and be like, well, maybe when you bitches decide to like threatening me. So I felt that was important to include because if we do continue to get into it and some of the things that I post are going to look crazy and I agree, they're crazy. And it would honestly make me feel better if something was severely wrong because this is just not the father that I know or the father that I've had. You know, like to this day, I don't even, I would never let a man talk any kind of way to me because my dad was always good to me. And then he just completely changed. So I just want to include that, that it could be that. And you don't, I don't know his mental situation, but like he used to do kind of crazy stuff and then say he had COVID. So we'd all call him or if we'd say, hey, I need some space because all you do is tell me how awful I am and how I have my mom's awful, shitty, bitch ass cunt genetics. So, hey, look, I'm in school. And can you not harass me when I'm in school? He wasn't paying for school, by the way. Oh, hi, Wolfie. I'm... Are you going <laughs> Are you going with them? No, I'm going with them. Okay, I love you. Um, so I woke up this morning to some disheartening messages from one of my baby daddies. Now, those of you that know me, many of you here have known me for 176 years. Um, I'm a single mom of five kids, and I have three baby daddies. Three. I said it. One, two, three. So one of them, Muscle Women's, is seeming to be a little bit upset because my oldest daughter, who's 23, about to be 24, a whole ass adult, posted a message to me that said, Happy Father's Day. And I reposted that and he was, I guess, upset. I don't really know. He posted a, a message, a cryptic message that said, you know, something about um, don't ask the dads why they're not with the, their kids. Ask the moms why they, you know, why they couldn't be there, why they weren't allowed. So I took that as a, you know, a situation because many, many people sent that to me. And I've noticed that he sends other messages too that are like, you know, talking about brainwashing and stuff and of kids and all of this. I would just like to say, and I hate to, do all this but you know when you come for me like ding dong I'm there up out of my bed I'm here to give it all of it to you that you wanted sir so I would just like to say my two girls and Ayoki Lee feels the same way even whether she posted it or not uh, my two girls just recently graduated from college um what Yoki graduated from Harvard University she's one of the youngest uh people students Certainly young women, women of color, to graduate from there at 20, at such a young age in probably most of recent history. We can go back together and see exactly when that, you know, when that, when that is, when that was, but she's one of them. My other daughter, who's 23, about to be 24, also a whole ass adult, Ming, um, just graduated from NYU. It was very, very tough. I know you moms know this and dads and you all the family members. It's not like one graduation. It's like 10. It's a different group. It's a different this. It's a different that. I went to New York for NYU. Congratulations to all the NU, NYU graduates. I saw so many of my friends, so many of my friends I haven't seen in forever that have like kids my age, my kids age and they're my age. So I saw so many people. I saw models from back in the day that one girl, uh, Anna Gatana came from Ethiopia. I mean, like I, I saw people from all over. So shout out to everybody in New York. I did the same in Boston um, with Ayoki at Harvard. My mom was there. Um, she's an immigrant. She's Korean Japanese. We were just super emotionally taken over by, you know, all of this and the accomplishments of all, all of our kids. And I say all of our kids because I talk to so many parents here and a lot of people, oh, everybody probably watching here knows me. So we've been through this together with my kids, with your kids, with everybody's kids. So um, some people who were noticeably absent was their dad. Um, and uh, Mr. Simmons. And so I noticed then, as soon as we started posting our graduation pictures and all these things, he starts to post on his 
um, Instagram, people send it to me because he's blocked by all my children and myself. He's blocked. We don't engage with him. We don't talk to him. We haven't spoken to him in many months, many, many, many months, probably going on years. Um, but I noticed that he started to cryptically post um, children of divorced parents are oftentimes brainwashed. And I thought, wow, you, and people really, you know, probably start to believe that in the world, social media, I don't know. People take sides, we all know that. People don't know what they see. You can show them something like this and they're like, I don't know if that was a hand. I don't know what that was. We're not sure, right? You don't know what you see or what you don't see. But I noticed that I got a lot of comments from that. Again, these are all comments and reports because I don't, he's blocked. Um, And that's been that way for a while. Um. Also funny to note that he has been blocked for quite a very long time, but yet continues to post messages like we're friends, we're comrades, we're there. He posts all old pictures of my kids. Basically, I, in my opinion, my humble opinion, he's, you know, I don't know, delusional and living some kind of a lie, to put it mildly. You know, again, people know me. You guys know me. I've some of you have never met me. You've grown up with me. You've seen my shows. You see my work. You wear my clothes. Um, others of you know me very well. You know me personally. You know my kids. You know my exes. You know the dads. A lot of people here um, know both of us, you know, and they know he's wrong. All the friends have said this is wrong. This is crazy. We don't understand it, but they still support him. I feel like it's one of those things where he's just like a big, bigger than life kind of, you know, uh, powerhouse. And so he just kind of turns and manipulates the press and people and to believe, you know, anything like you, like gaslighting, you know, like that didn't happen. I didn't do that to you. Uh, I didn't do those things to you. I didn't, you know, you're imagining things. How many countless women have said this, have been told this, I should say, or would say this to you? myself and my two girls who are adults included you know you guys didn't just start to see my kids we didn't just go through a divorce we went through this divorce i don't know 20 years ago 20 some odd years ago so this is not a situation again you can get receipts you can go see where they say like oh kids been brainwashed but we've been fine up until these past several years so, you know, what happened? All of a sudden now the kids are brainwashed. All of a sudden now these young women who are grown women are babies. You know, you they, they have their own relationship with you. You have their, your own non-existent relationship with them. I'm just asking that you please leave us alone. You know, I've tried to go to lawyers and get help. I've tried to show all the crazy texts I've had to block. Like, you do crazy shit like send pic. pic put flowers to yourself and take a picture and send, post it on the gram and tell everybody I sent you flowers. Again, I have receipts of all of this. I have receipts from your office saying that you sent flowers to yourself without my permission. I have all of this. You guys have never seen it because it just doesn't war it, you know. It doesn't rise to that occasion. I mind my own business. But please don't attack my children. They've been through so much. Um, don't attack my, my family, which is supposed to be your family too. Don't do that because you're, you know, you're at rock bottom. You, I don't know. Hypothetically, you're at rock bottom. Time has come for Hollywood in general to be sensitive to the plight that they've put women in over these years. And they should change dramatically their relationships and, and their, their, their practices, and they are changing. The latest powerful man brought down by allegations of sexual misconduct, music mogul Russell Simmons. There he is, and he is stepping down from his companies after a second woman spoke out. Amy, you've got the details. That's right, and this new allegation comes from a screenwriter. She says Simmons offered her a ride back home in 1991, but they wound up at his place where she says she was coerced into having sex. This morning, music mogul Russell Simmons stepping away from his businesses amid allegations of sexual misconduct. Simmons, known as the CEO of hip hop after starting Def Jam Records in the 80s and producing and starring in reality television. The show you told me over the phone? Yeah, Rock Chicks. Under fire after screenwriter Jenny Lumet, who wrote The Mummy. You saw that, right? 
and whose father is director Sidney Lumet, shared her account of a 1991 encounter with Simmons, saying he offered her a ride home before the car doors locked, and he allegedly took her to his own apartment where they had a sexual encounter that she says was non-consensual. Lumet writing, I didn't know if the situation would turn violent. I remember thinking that I must be crazy. I remember hoping that the Russell I knew would return at any moment. Simmons releasing a statement in response saying, while her memory of that evening is very different from mine, it is now clear to me that her feelings of fear and intimidation are real. While I have never been violent, I have been thoughtless and insensitive in some of my relationships over many decades, and I sincerely apologize. The allegations coming after model Carrie Clausen Kaligi told the LA Times about a 1991 encounter with Simmons and film director Brett Ratner. Carrie Clausen Kaligi alleges they went out to dinner and afterwards uh, she was invited to go back to Simmons's uh, residence in New York to watch a music video. She alleges that Russell Simmons uh, sexually assaulted her and when she asked Brett Ratner for help to intervene, he did not do so. Russell Simmons has denied these accusations. Ratner's attorney has also reportedly denied the allegation. In recent years, Simmons often spoke about his spiritual journey, as he told Dan Harris last year. Oh, yeah, good comic work is very critical. I mean, give others what you want for yourself. You should give the happiness, the freedom, the opportunity that you want for yourself to others. What are my thoughts on Russell Simmons? Well, remember when I said this? While well, in a very important man's office talking about working together, uh, we ever fucked? No. Oh, right, because I would remember that, right? So that very important person's office I was in who said that to me? That was Russell Simmons. So that's my thoughts on that. Like, I've known you, and everybody knows. Again, that's documented. You can see. Um, I believe I was... Maybe a sophomore. You and Russell Simmons go way back. We do. Um, we do. We do. Now, I guess you had talked about you were with Russell when he was with Kimora when she was 16? I was at a lunch uh, in the Hamptons with maybe about eight, nine people. Um, and, yeah, it was a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And... Uh, yeah, Kamora was there. Uh, she barely spoke, if at all, but she was 16 and she was around a group of 20 and 30 somethings. The Cinderella of fairy tale fame wears magnificent clothes, is touched by magic, and has to be home by midnight or else. Cinderella in real life is Kamora Perkins, a 15 year old high school student. She lives in St. Louis, but the world is her pumpkin and she shares it with us in today's Inside Story. She's only 15 years old and is the toast of the international high fashion world. And this gorgeous six foot tall model leads a double life. Part of the time, she's that real life Cinderella who dresses up for the ball. But back home in St. Louis, Missouri, she's 10th grade student Kimora Perkins. The gorgeous gowns and, and oh, it's, you know, it's easy to get wrapped up in it. But, but no, it didn't overtake me because I knew I still had to get, take off the gown and come home and go back to school. So it was easy to keep my feet on the ground. Kimora spends 12 weeks out of the school year away from home, working in Europe and New York for the likes of Chanel and Yves Saint Laurent. Although she won't turn 16 until next May, she's remarkably mature and says that she's able to keep her distance from the darker undersides of her seemingly glamorous profession. But, uh, you know, look, look he, he, you know, there, there's some bickering about was she 16 or 17? I remember being introduced to her and being told that she was 16, even if she was only 17. What are we talking about here? You were in your 30s, and she's either. I mean, that's the the point. Is it was she 16 or 17? I don't really. Th even if we concede 17, like what's really the difference? I know it was before junior prom and senior prom because I went to both of those proms alone with my friends when I was dating them. So it was definitely long before junior and senior prom. I think it was around sophomore year of high school. And again, everybody knows this in my life. You know, they know, they, I was walking around, they see me. The point of it is I've known you a long time and I've seen lots of stuff and I just choose to not go there. Um, lots of things that I could say over the time you know, I'm typically the one that he and others would call to have their back. Your child, your household, what goes on in your home? What kind of shit are you running? That's your baby daddy. Yeah. Whether you're with or not, you 
we cannot allow this kind of disrespect. But, you know, I'm always the one that kind of puts out the fire. I'm also the one that always runs to the defense of all my friends. So if you see uh, any other women, certainly women that I've come up with, certainly women that are, are mothers of my children, other of my kids that I love, I come to their defense. So if they're down and out or something's wrong, yeah, you're always going to see Kimora, big mouth me, running up to the gate, running up to help. And you know why? It's because I feel like I'm the one that can't be bowled over. Some of these other people can be bowled over. A lot of my women, you know, friends and other moms, they've gone through things. I've lost friends of mine. <laughs> I love you, man. Bye. I got my MTV out. I'm a savage! I'm a savage! Oh! I'm a savage! Whatever I want, I'm going to get! Whatever I want, I have to get! Lil Rod says hidden cameras were in every room of Diddy's homes. Lil Rod believes that Mr. Combs possesses compromising footage of every person that has attended his freak-off parties and his house parties. Salacious tapes of Hollywood's biggest names, including record CEOs and politicians doing drugs and cavorting with prostitutes and minors. Diddy's homes in Los Angeles and Miami were raided, raided by Homeland Security, and everything we're hearing is this is in connection with the human trafficking, the sex trafficking allegations that have been made against him in the various civil cases. You keep mentioning Diddy. I wanted to ask you about the fee. Uh, oh. I just saw the whole thing with uh, Bad Boy. He got all his. He gave the rights back to a lot of Bad Boy artists. Any comments? Um, yeah, I'll talk about this. The floor is yours. So, <laughs> this one has been bittersweet for me because I'm. As I've gotten older, mm -hmm. I've let go of a lot of the trauma. I wasn't willing to uh, do what w was expected of me. Mm. Not talent-wise, but in other areas. Mm -hmm. And were other girls doing? I was the only one that was in those types of positions. Wow. When you look back on that, how does that make you feel? You know, I have such a love-hate with it all because I don't think I would have been able to be so successful in so many other areas had I not been trained under Diddy. Mm -hmm. He was the hardest person that you can work for. Why are we getting real one? Y'all two go back. Go back, go back. Come on, I need you to put yourself in that nightclub. Be right there. You're in a crowded club, and it's just one cat. You know what I'm saying? Is there any way that I could turn this so I could look? Because that helps me. I, I'm a, like, to get the performance. Oh, man, if you don't sing that damn song, ain't like turn this <laughs> Sing the song, girl. <laughs> <laughs> And it was torture and not the work part of it, but the other stuff, mind games, like just all the girls were so divided and the men and the people running it were the, had their hands in it, mm -hmm. moving everything. Um, there was a lot of betrayal. There was a lot of lies. There was a lot of, um, you know, when you're, when you're young and impressionable and you're just, we understand our beauty as women through the eyes of the people observing us. Well, who's observing us? Men. We're going to go with Shannon and Cowie. Okay. Okay. They can stay up all night. Okay.
Cut the music. What in the hell is going on? White girls can dance now and ain't got asses. What in the hell is going on? I never, you heard White that girls can girl dance sister. now and ain't got asses. So we learn our beauty through a man's eye, which is is very subjective. So it's it's difficult when you're that young to understand your worth as a woman through the men that I was around, and that was very traumatic. And he is the first person that gave me a platform to show my talent to the world. Um, you know, and that was at 17, I'm 39 now. So I have a hard time, I have a hard time talking about him before, before it was no good. Now I'm feeling, I feel loving moments for moments that we had together. Mm -hmm. But this banner that he's painted himself with all weekend long, this has been the Labor Day talk in my world, that he's paying back all of the bad boy artists. Um, I just want to throw you the facts, okay? Sure. The deal that we were offered, and when I say we, not every artist got it. Like day 26 did not get it. But um, this is what it is. You can have your rights back um, to your music after Puff went under and somebody else bought our catalog. So this is long after we have two double platinum albums, $14, $15 an album from two million albums is, what is the math on that, 48 million? Yeah, something like that. I'm a mathematician, but maybe. So, so $48 million somebody made on me. Yeah. I did not make anything. When I said I did Chris, Christine Aguilera for free, I didn't do Christine Aguilera for free, but the record label recouped it all. We were in debt at the end of that tour. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So, so I worked for free for the first six, seven years of my career, basically. And also MTV was not paying us. And this is another part that I have that I feel some kind of way about because MTV since then in these, these recent years has brought back every big cult show, meaning it had millions of followers and it was at least six seasons, right? Yeah. Making the Band is one of those. They brought back Real World. They brought back Jersey Shore. They brought back Laguna Beach. Making the Band is the only one that they did not bring back. And Making the Band is the only cult MTV show that made that network, one of them, that they have never played in one rerun. Not one rerun. So I'd like to know why. And if it has something to do with Diddy, then again, what I'm wondering is when we're not being, when the deal is, when this benevolent man who's just now had a change of heart and has decided to pay us as talent and also as pub as writers were credited um, in, in with publishing. Um, so basically, we only get the amounts due since Sony bought our catalog. Okay. So streaming for the past couple years, it's about eight hundred nine hundred dollars, some in the hundreds. Okay. And in order to get that, I have to release him for any claims or wrongdoings or actions prior to the date of the release. I have to sign an NDA that I will never disparage Puff, Bad Boy, Janice Combs, or Justin Combs Music, or EMI, or Sony ever in public. The and we weren't, we weren't being paid. I mean, it don't, don't it. get it twisted. Diddy, like it was what it was. Diddy didn't ever yeah. send the check. We never got a big <laughs> yeah, like it was on it. payment. Like, I never yeah. moved. So yeah, I don't know. We, had to, we had to like that. each other without getting paid. We right. had to like each other genuinely because we believed in creating something that was powerful for women. It's the same thing that he gave to all his artists when he gave them their publishing back. I'm going to give you all y'all publishing. But y'all can't talk about Janice Cone, Justin Cone, uh, Sony, Bad Boy, or anything that happened. Y'all can't talk about none of that. But there's some artists that didn't say anything, that didn't sign it, and they able to talk about anything they want to. And I think that's those girls that was, I think, Danny D. Kane. I think a couple of them didn't sign it. And boy, oh boy, they probably going to go after him too. Because I heard him, and I'm giving you this, Aubrey. He stood up there and he said in front of a lot of people, we were in the studio, 
And I said something to him and walked out the studio. He said, yo, I'm a drug their ass off and pick them out and, and, and pip them out to my, <laughs> pip them out to my nick. He said, I'm a drug them out. I'm going to get them all on drugs and I'm going to pimp their ass out to my nick. And I was like, there's somebody kids and walked out. And there's somebody that heard me. It's somebody that heard me. I mean, well, it's not only somebody that heard me. It's somebody that I know who was in the studio at the time that happened, and I still talk to him today. And we were just talking about that the other day. So that you just got recently for this thing. I got it a few months ago when okay, he started for doing what's this. In the news now. So what's happening is artists, some of them, not all of them, are being given streaming royalties and ownership back over our publishing on songs that we wrote um, at a time when you know that you have to stream a song a million times to make point a, a cent. Yeah. If you were to sign that NDA, would then that prohibit you from taking a deal where it's like you get a show about the I would past? never be able to do, I would like to do a documentary for Hulu or Netflix or Amazon, a streaming site no, on enough. boy band and girl bands. I, w I have a bunch of members from a lot of very boy bands that fit the criteria of a certain amount of, of status. Yeah platinum albums, awards, et cetera, Grammys, same with girls. The stories that we have to tell during a time in music where there were gatekeepers, there were people that owned labels like Puff running things, and the way that the divisions and the divisiveness occurred and the things that we experienced between each other and us against the system are fucking insane. Please tell me what it is you want. Truck pull over. I'm not changing nothing. This okay, well, you wanted the weed out the weed out. I just want you to you look want, good. You're not happy. You hate me, then why are you having me here? I don't have to have you here. That's one thing that we can make clear. That's one thing we can make clear. But I don't have to have you here. I'm trying. I have you here. I have you here because I feel you talented. But don't get it twisted. I'm starting to think about why do I have you here. Okay, so you clear on that, though. This is the honest to God you can read from our attorney. Yeah. This is the honest to God agreement of what I'm being offered a few hundred dollars to sign away my rights to ever tell the story of what I went through again. And there's not going to be an era of girl and guy groups like that ever again with the way that music has transitioned. And I don't know if it will go back ever again to anything that's credible. Yeah, I don't know. I'd don't really and, see it. and there's a story there, and Hulu tells those stories, and 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 streaming, so Netflix tells those stories, and there's so many paychecks. I offered girls, I called all of them, I offered some of the girls, hey, if you need eight, nine hundred bucks, I'll give it to you. Don't sign this. This is just a way to get you to never be able to publicly speak about what we have experienced, and that and and to my knowledge, allegedly. There's only two of us from Danity Kane that did not sign this deal. And were there five originally? Yeah. Darn. And and it seems like a lot of other people are too. But you don't see them talking about how great and maybe the deals are not the same that we're being offered. I don't know. But yeah. in this email, it does say the money that you're getting is not coming through Puffy or Combs Music. This is a deal with Sony Music. Okay. Sony would be the ones that were paying us, EMI and Sony. And then you'd be getting the money back from Down to Decay Music. I would get any muse, any money that that the songs I wrote on that were streamed yes. make, which is a couple hundred dollars. Mm. This is not the money that we made when we released the albums. Yes. This is not the forty-eight million dollars that two platinum albums got somebody. This is just some measly streaming money in order to stay hushed on Puff. Why he wants all of a sudden right now at this time, day and moment to offer deals to people that some of his artists have been rumored to be driving Uber to be able to feed their families. So a deal like this looks pretty good because you need the money or because you're scared to ever go against Puff. I'm somewhere in the middle of I don't give a fuck. Yeah, I don't need the money. I'm clearly making it, as we've discussed. And and I, I just wish that Puff would 
do what he's saying he's doing. I wish he would pay us what we deserved for all the work that we did. And I wish he would make right his wrongs. And I wish these headlines could be real, not only for me and not because I need that money, but because I want there to be closure with a man that gave me my first opportunity in this game. And because you gave that to me did not mean that you could take all the money that I made you. That's very fair. Yeah. And so when everyone's discussing this, I'm the only one now that's come forward and I'm telling you, I'm showing you exactly what the deal looks like. And it's a few hundred bucks and I'd own it from here on out, and I would not be, be paying anywhere anywhere close to buy Diddy or anyone. It would be through Sony, who now owns the catalog. Yes, okay. And and, then, and would... I would have to sign off a, a disclosure. And not being able to talk about it. Talk about yeah. it or ever come after them for wrongdoings, auditing, or anything else regarding the things that happened in the past. It's crazy stuff. I think you made a good choice not signing it. And and so when everybody's so excited and sending me these messages, I I I wish they would ask themselves now that they know the the nature of at least the deal that that we were given. And I asked my I asked the person that brought this deal forward and they said you the girls in the group, some girls didn't write as much as you, a few girls did. I'm right in the middle. And it's okay. a cup. It's a couple hundred bucks. So at the end of the day, I I urge everyone to think about the headline versus the truth, and really what this seems to be is a way to shut a lot of people up. And what would be the motivation to do that? story we're following and of course we're trying to gather more and more information about it here on live now from fox as diddy's home in los angeles has been raided by uh homeland security of course we're learning more information i do want to take you back out here before we get out to our fox 11 team in their coverage because some of this video is very dramatic and we don't know a ton of information right now as you can see potentially law enforcement officials and other officials just outside of a gate this on a street uh, near the Beverly Hills area. Of course, we're following it very closely on Live Now from Fox. And of course, we were watching this. We didn't know exactly what we were seeing at the time. So this is just a little bit ago as they, you can see a crowbar to get through this gate initially as well. The long guns and a multitude of people, as you'll see, they'll zoom out a little bit just to see the amount of force they are using to get inside this home. And of course, the complex in which this home sits is a very expansive one for the American rapper and producer. You can see them checking inside of a vehicle. We don't know exactly what is involved, if Diddy's even there. We don't know a ton of information about this at all, but this was dramatic video coming in of the Los Angeles home there, raided by Homeland Security. Some of those images there on the backs of them. We also saw uh, other images. I want to kind of quickly move to what else we saw as people were led away, potentially in custody. Don't know who these individuals are, if they're related to Diddy in any way, but you can see them, a dramatic video from our Sky Fox team there in Los Angeles as we continue to cover this. Top local story right now in the raid on Sean Diddy Combs' L.A. residence by federal agents. This is a story that we broke here on Fox 11. Mario Ramirez is outside of his Holmby Hills home right now with the latest developments for us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Quiet right now, but it was a chaotic scene with federal agents rushing into the home here behind me. There were two separate raids, one here in this upscale neighborhood, the other in Miami, both connected to a federal sex trafficking investigation. Take a look. Fox 11 was the first to show you the raid here locally, led by Homeland Security, heavily armored federal agents making their way into the home on Mapleton Drive, associated with rap mogul Sean Diddy Combs and his production company, Bad Boy Films. Dozens of agents searched the property for hours hours leaving with boxes of evidence a similar scene at the miami beach property listed in his name as well the properties 
raided in connection to a sex trafficking investigation, although Department of Homeland Security officials haven't named Diddy as the focus. The 54-year-old has been at the center of several sexual assault and sex, traffic, uh, sex trafficking allegations in the last year. That's something Variety's executive music editor has been covering extensively. Listen. Been rumors like this for years. Do you know Sean Combs? Pop Daddy. Yeah. P Diddy, whatever you call it. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's part of what's called the Boulet. The, the Boulet. Is, the Boulet is a branch of the Illuminati. Okay. It's the black people. I had settlement with Sean, okay? And he belongs to that agenda. That's why he's so famous. They land all the contracts. It's his attorneys, which are Mark Garagos and Ben Mercedes. I had sex with Cassie and Sean. Basically, he would, uh, he would masturbate and tell me what to do with Cassie. I had like 15 encounters and I heard a lot of business because what they would do is Sean talks a lot on the, on the phone and on the TV with speakers and stuff and I would be in the, I was like a sex slave, okay? For them, that's what I was. That's all, all right? Um, I caught herpes and I came back and I sued him for the herpes and won. But they didn't, did Mark Eros and Ben Mercedes were his attorneys, okay? And Christopher Leons here was my attorney. They asked me to turn in that, which was the video recording, and I did so. They gave it back to me accidentally, and it's possible, I, I threw everything out, it's possible I can produce a copy. Mark Gerogos used to be Michael Jackson attorney. Yeah, out in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. he had a, yeah, he dropped Michael and they all deed him, okay? He didn't overdose. They all deed him. Because they keep the royalties of the music. Michael alone made $860 million alone last year. What happened is Diddy and Ross, which they good buddies, okay? Mm -hmm. They they they're gay. Who? Both. Diddy and Ross and Cattle. They all gay. Okay? DJ Kelly, Rick Ross, yeah. and P. Diddy? Yeah. They all gay? Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Khaled is a Hamas supporter. Okay. Who supporter? Hamas. 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 Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Sorry, I said the wrong. No, 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 no. no Hamas supporter. Okay. All right. Basically, he's Arab, Palestinian. Okay. Um, the Sirach agenda, okay, is basically. Binge drinking poured out on a yacht. They promote binge drinking and drugs. Gotcha. Um, the hip hop agenda was supported, was laid out by Obama during his last presidencies purposely. That's why they had Tupac killed. Because when they kill them, you gain fame. When people, your record sales go up and then people listen to your lyrics and everything and then you become famous, okay? That's how they do it, all right? Um, Chewback's still alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's in Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what happens is following. The hip hop agenda is an agenda to move drugs along the United States. Mm -hmm. move, you need to involve the DEA. They they move all the dope, okay, all the dope on private jets, which don't get screened by by uh, by customs by by the, yeah, yeah, yeah. By the okay. inside the United States, okay. They they move what's called high grade powered MDMA. They move cocaine and they move uh, liquid cocaine in the bottles too, okay. So they put the liquid cocaine in the bottles and they move it. I seen the liquid cocaine, I've drank it myself. Having sex with Diddy and Cassie. Okay? It's not good. He drinks it all the time. I wanna take him back. What's he gonna do? What's he gonna do for him, Jay? I wanna take him back a little bit. Fuck. We'll see it, my nigga. You Put know your Rockefeller shit. You gave me the Ushka Screw Smash. You gave me the Ushka Smooth Off. The Smooth Smash. Diddy. Yeah, son. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? You gave me the Ushka Smooth Wash. I love it, yo. I love it. You gave me the Uskash Mwash. And. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! That Uskash Mwash. You know what I'm talking about, Diddy? 
Mm. Mm. I don't know about the room. What, what room was that? What, uh, they say, uh, nah, I ain't gonna say that. I heard about that, though. But I ain't about to say that. But, what? what was I ain't it? about to say that on, on, on my side. You and Diddy? You and Diddy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you and Diddy. You and Diddy what? You and Diddy. No. They, they said he was... <laughs> Him and Diddy what? Was, I'm just saying the room. I ain't never heard this one. They said he was... He How was, you knew that? How you, how you, how you now I'm about to Google, because I ain't never that's heard this one. That, huh? I'm saying, you, that's the, nobody would ever say that one. Oh, they, they, yeah. So here goes Envy. They said that he said he was Diddy's boy toy. What? I was in Jamaica with him. Oh, I see it now. See? Is that well, what I can't Osiris in Jamaica with his alleged boo Diddy. Now, now, Fifth, when you continuously call Puff gay, does that affect no. your relationships in Hollywood? I don't call. No, I don't call. I don't call him gay. I said, let I, me read it. Let me read okay, it, read. Fifth. Oh my God. Sorry, I can no longer Shades help confused. you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under the leadership of Puffy Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow. Dinner thieves. In theaters, January. Oh, that's <laughs> why I get tired. Then the thieves get tired. Yeah, that's drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he said gay and happy. No, no, I'm just saying to you. You always say Jackson like, that's why I get invited to pop party. No reason. Listen, listen. I'm on saying that because of the that, what's the name interview? Nori. The Drake champs. Yes, yes. What's going on, my brother? How you doing? Oh man, man. Yo, it's Groove here. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, yeah, yeah, birthday yeah. to you. Woo! Happy birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday. This is fabulous. The only nigga that got the name that I want. get. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. He says things. He doesn't even know what he's saying. It's like fruity. Hey yo, Rastafari, Rastafari. Hey yo, don't do that. Yeah, that's what I said. That's why I said. Let me pick it up. Let me pick it up from right there. This is how I gotta pick it up from right there. Look at that nigga. Bad thing, bro. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 bro. Kill him. Look, come tell the story, bro. Bro, we, bro, we intoxicated. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, oh, Groovy, oh, you Groovy, you help me build that yeah, beautiful, yeah, nice Groovy, guy, Rastafari brand of yours, huh? I love this drink, Chance, you put my bag you. I like when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, where you put my bag Daddy, I like when you, oh, when you right scrambling right and here. scraping no, for no, no, shit. No, 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 I got I like that. You know, I'll be practicing. I got notes Yeah, there you go. Got your notes. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to go over that one. Make a wish. Just blow it out. Your birthday every day. Every day is a birthday on Drink Champs, goddammit. I'm in. Okay. He said something fabulous and he goes, yo, no, we, no, but me and you, we ain't party. Like, we need to party. Did you miss me, though? Mm. For real, because we, I'm I saying, miss, it seems like a thing. I miss his birthday party. Puff, man. Man, but party I'm talking about for your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? Mm. You always respected me as a um, lyricist and as a writer. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me up there from 2002 to 2009. Well, did you at least see any parties or been to his parties? The infamous Diddy parties that everybody talks about? I've been to the parties, but like I said, I, I I don't know. They select you. You be you're you're selected. Be, be, so, be more descriptive. I'm gonna be said. more selective. You yeah. have to fit a, a certain description. Mm -hmm. You have to fit a certain mannerism for you to be led down that hallway with the door. Whoa, 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 whoa. He, he whoa. Has, he, Yo, no, don't do that. that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving it to you hold real. On, on, you have to fit a certain on, description, on, on, a certain mannerism, Ness, a body on, type, hold, hold a type of mannerism, a type of mentality for you to get hold, hold on, led down Ness, the, that hallway with the door. Somebody's such a pretty looking boy. Tell me, tell me, wait a minute. Tell me, what I want to ask you at that time, mm -hmm. like, 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 why? Why am I being excluded from this? You didn't, that didn't like raise your antennas of, of that? Me being young and at that time I just wanted to be famous and I wanted to be a superstar off of rap. Yeah, music. Well, something you didn't want to be in no parties. Nah, was, nah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Something's behind that closed door, right? Bro, but it wasn't out like it is now. Yeah. It's not. Yeah, right. but you want to know. You can go you on the internet know. and but look. He's probably not looking it's at it not like that. out like it is right. now. It was still taboo. Nobody was speaking on it. Yeah. You you couldn't speak on it. You didn't have a network of people that could huddle up and talk about it. Yeah, the, that outwork that network of people outweighed yours by far. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you would get pitched into a little corner talking about, talking about who's though. this and right. who's that. Yeah. You would run into a brick wall because yeah. it would be those on the other side. Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I, I know what you're saying. Wanna, Let I, me keep it a bean with you. The way they attack you is through photo shoots and video shoots. They send in the stylist. If you're getting your hair braided, one of those two of guys might be not the way you th think they should be. Mm -hmm. And if you're showing them the most love and yippity yappity with them, that's the battlefield. 
That's where they see. Oh, he had a lot of rap for the guy yeah, yeah, over yeah, here. Right, 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 ah, right, right, he's yeah, one yeah. of them. All right, all right. That's that's what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, shit, that's what I'm he talking about. They can see who it is. Who, yeah. who's who? Yeah, they just yeah. Yeah. Less, I wear my pants off my ass. I wear jerseys. As I smoke weed all day. I'm bringing bitches in and out the house. He's not. Ness is not right. the candidate. That's right. That's right. Ness is not the candidate. is not the Ness is not the candidate for the bullshit. It wasn't like that. Nah, so let me ask you this. Hold on. Let me ask you this. Who out the group of that, who y'all was with, was kind of, kind of, I don't know. I, I was paying attention to the bitches. Me, the thing that was happening recently was that with the whole cancellation of Diddy, you know, Diddy got canceled. with Because of Cassie? Like she took it back, though. I know, but like, it's unclear. So he, but this was something I've been talking about for years because he... It's like a, now a documented thing that I saw him like at a party in Miami. Like I was at a party in Miami that I should not have been at, like some real black excellence shit that <laughs> I was not deserving to be at, but I went with the DJ. Yeah. And I took ecstasy and I ended up wandering around in some mansion on Star Island. And I end up walking, I guess it was his mansion. And I end up, it's all like just hot. It's all hot black people. Yeah. Like, and then just like one moron with an afro. And everyone's like, how do Oh, right. When you had an afro. They're like, whose man is this? <laughs> yeah. But I came in and I basically saw him. I walked in a room I shouldn't have walked into. And I saw him like hooking up with a dude. Basically, like full spooning situation. This guy, Felix the house cat, who's like a producer. Whatever. I then told the story on a podcast. And then his people called me and were like, you need to say you were joking. Like, say you're a funny guy. And like, you made it up for the yeah. views. And I was yeah. like, but I, no, but I did not. I saw it. And he saw me when I came in. Were you like, like a little scared? Yes. Yeah, because everyone in the room like stopped. Because I opened the door and was like, is this the bathroom? And everyone was like, no, this is a room where like celebrities, like male celebrities hook up. <laughs> it's like some glitterati shit. Yeah. Um, and then he basically had people call me and like threaten me and like tell me that if I didn't take it back and say I was joking. And you still didn't take it back? Confused, no. Why? And then I talked about it on Hot 97, and they wouldn't air it. Um, Ebro, who does the morning show on Hot 97, they so Hot 97 always kept me on a pre-record because they were like, what are you going to say? <laughs> yeah. They would never let me do a live interview. And I told the story, and then afterwards, he was like, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to run this interview because, like, Diddy's insane, and he'll, like, he blew up Kid Cudi's car and all this shit. So and I, and I, I feel was like, like you did that on purpose. Like, you're like, you wanted to see if he what he'd do to you. No, I wanted to get killed by Diddy. <laughs> But now, he, now everyone just found out that he like blows up people's. Kid Cudi finally told the story. Oh, he did. I've been did? saying this for years. I've been like, oh, oh Kid Cudi is cute, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> like fuckable. <laughs> yeah. No, like he seems like a good guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like he's you know the original like sort of like he kind of invented like anxiety depressed rap. Yeah, yeah. Because no one like was doing that, and then he was like, I'm sad and like on like medication. Right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, like everyone. And then was, Logic like, did it. A lot um, of people like started being yeah, like, yeah. I'm sad and like I like, but he was the first one to be like, I'm on Wellbutrin. Yeah. Um, but I've been talking about this Diddy shit for years, and now it's like out there. We want to thank you, come here. Don't don't sit on the bed and no homo. No, just just don't get close to the bed. Don't get close to the bed. But it's just like yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man. Man, you, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it. You did. No, no, no. I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not getting the bed. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just gonna. If we can, just let's let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not. I don't want my shot to even. Like, I don't want it to come close to the bed. At all. I should look like he fresh, fresh off the goddamn, goddamn plane. Yeah. I should. I should. I should. I should. Fresh off the guard stage. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the frosted flakes. You know what I'm saying? Before pause was invented. You know what I'm saying? But it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the all for the frosted flakes because he used to always get up early with me. <laughs> now he's one of the richest stars yo, in the world. And I'm yo, like, what, what the, the fuck, fuck did Puff, Puff just, just say? Good. Nobody's going to acknowledge this for me. Puff just said we used to wrestle over the frosted flakes. And we're streaming live. That was stupid. Moved to New York City. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. To learn <laughs> Flavor some... Camp. Yeah, Flavor Camp. Yeah, that's what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's gonna In the 90s. Do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop, right? No, not really. Remember, Usher? We was at the Swiss Hotel. Puff was had Kim in the room. Had one of Keith Sweat's baby mothers in the in in the uh the big room outside the master bedroom. He came outside in his robe. 
He came outside in his robe. She gave him a fellatio right there. His back was turned to me. She gave him a fellatio. You knocked on the door. I came and opened the door for you. Puff went in the room. You came in the room and kissed that girl dead in the mouth. You know, and a lot of more people know, didn't do you right. When you was at Diddy camp. Y'all put it together. Damn, man. And you said that, I know you can't go into detail, but you said that uh, it was a situation where Diddy sent him to the hospital? Let Usher explain that to you. Let Usher mom explain that to you. And the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. I Come mean, on. but there, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, <laughs> and it was, but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't and, say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say you that. Didn't, <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh huh. Biggie Smalls was Biggie there. Biggie Smalls was there. Lil Kim, Craig Mack. All know, these people all are hanging these, around. All, yeah, man. Faith Evans. Jody and your C, were Mary okay? J. Blosh. They ain't know nothing about this shit. Oh. <laughs> I was having a good time. You know what I mean? Does he have you doing any chores? Are you doing dishes at all? I mean, to keep you humble somewhat? Or are you just like, can you stay up till four in the morning with them and party? I mean, I could. I yeah. actually stayed up longer than them. <laughs> and and, what and do you have money? What's going on? I mean, I had like per diem. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, had, I had like, you know, what like a, a living. life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to Puffy Camp? <laughs> Hell no. What's up, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? All right, doing? young brother. Everything's good? Everything's Selling great. out arenas and everything? Yeah. Starting to act different, huh? You, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't... I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But... You, you never really got my number, so. Right, okay. My number? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Tell you my number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so... As soon as you turn 16... You know what I'm saying? I'm going to let you rock this every time you come right. to LA. Yeah, this will be yours. So, every oh, time you come okay. to LA, it's a little dusty, but you know, we can put it in the front shot. Man. Minute. Woo. Okay. Okay. All right, so so I'm going to be driving this yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, when you get 16, you come down there, you got to, you know, wear your seat. I mean, I'm 15. Thing. You could ride in the passenger seat. I got my permit. Now that, not yet. No, 16. No, no, 16. Slow right. down. Let's slow down, Josh. Okay. Let's okay. slow down, okay? One, one step at a time. But, yeah, yeah, the keys is yours when you, you know, when you get 16. You're All good right. to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. All right. And then, when you get 18, you get the house. You okay. get the mansion. Okay. I yeah. get the mansion? Yeah. Right. So, where, where, where are we off to now? Where would you like to go? Um, I mean, wherever you want to go. Where, where are we going? <laughs> we just, so, check this out, yo. Um, Justin, he's in, you ever seen the movie 48 Hours? Right now, he's having 48 hours with Diddy, him and his boy. Um, they're having the times of their lives, like, 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 the, you know, where we hanging out and what we doing. Um, we, we can't really disclose, but um, it's definitely a 15-year-old's dream. Um, you know, I, I, I have been given custody of him. You know, he yeah. signed to Usher. I'm signed to Usher. I, I, I had legal guardianship of Usher when, when you know, he, he did his first album. I did yes. Usher's first album. I don't really, I don't have legal guardianship of him, but for the next 48 hours, he's with me. So, um, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. Crazy. I'm taking this out tonight. What you want to do? What you want to do over the next 48 hours? 48 hours. Let's go. Um, are we gonna? Let's just go get some girls. Let's go hang with some girls. A man after my heart. That's what I'm talking about. My name's Ava. I'm a Scorpio. No, no, no. What's your last name? Oh, Ava Combs. What's your other oh. last name? Ava Baroni. Ava Baroni Combs. Yes, it's it was breaking news. Diddy adopted a white child. <laughs> I want you. I want you to tell them the story about how I adopted you. We, but you still have beautiful parents that. But you're my child also, but please, please tell the story. So, <laughs> I was 
on the streets. <laughs> And then Papa Combs decided <laughs> that he would like to be a caring man. So then he saw me and decided to pick me up and said to come inside and play with his kids. That's like a little bit like borderline suspect. <laughs> I, I don't want nobody. You know, we want to get it clear. I, I adopted you like Madonna adopted kids and everybody else adopted kids. Charlize Theron, everybody that's ever adopted Sandra Bullock. I adopted you because I felt that you could, you know, um, enjoy also having a black parent to take care of you and help you out. So, um, um, just clarify it, because it's, it's crazy out here online. So, so we, we play with the kids, and I got permission from your mother. And to say all of that, to just make it, because it's crazy out here. Um, well, I met Jesse and Dwyla when I was six months old. Six months. Yeah. And six then months. we basically are sisters, all <laughs> four sisters. of us. So. Six and months is crazy. I always come over. Yes. And, and it's Ava mm -hmm. Brioni Combs. Come on. I was personally disturbed many years ago, okay? I, I, I know this man well enough to call him and say, hey, I need a favor. Yeah. And this might have been 10, 12 years ago that I called him and say, hey, I have a family member who I want you to hire them as an intern. Yeah. And uh, I have never talked about this publicly. And, I, and he said yes. And they were flying around, one of the interns, Atlanta, Miami, whatever, on the jet, in the house, whatever. And then the internship stopped abruptly, like three or four months into it. Yeah. And I spoke to my family member, like, well, what happened? And they wouldn't say. Yeah. And I'm like, what, what do you, well, why did it end? And he wouldn't yeah. say. And years later, they finally came out, and this is a male, yeah. and said that uh, Puff had said, come home, stay the night with me, or the internship is over. And they said, absolutely not. He said, absolutely not. And the internship ended. Uh, but from there, I was like, oh, like, oh, this is this is God. how it goes. OK. Yeah. And then just last month, a former employee of Combs filed a suit also uh, in the state of New York, accusing him of sexual assault, of sexual harassment and, quote, grooming. That former employee stated that he had worked for Combs between 2022 and 2023. Among those allegations, this former employee, a male employee, said that Combs did not compensate him for his music production work and forced him to procure and interact with sex workers, threatened him with serving alcoholic beverages beverages laced with drugs to guests at parties at Combs' home. And then uh, Combs' uh, son, Sean Justin Combs, or uh, his son, Justin Combs, was also, also accused of soliciting prostitutes and underage girls at his father's homes. Again, the Combs have denied any wrongdoing, but just a series of allegations that we've seen taking place. Final point, Wolf, I'll note is that while we don't know the specific allegations or why the feds are at these residences, it is worth pointing out the agency that is conducting this law enforcement activity. It's not the FBI. It's not the DEA or the ATF. This is HSI, Homeland Security Investigations. For those unfamiliar, this is an agency that has long been the forefront specifically at human trafficking investigations. So although we don't have the specifics yet, uh, we're starting to, to you know, we, we can glean just based on which agency has the lead, the direction this might go. Uh, but again, we don't yet know that Combs himself was the target of the investigation, Wolf. We do know that at the, this hour that federal agents were at two of his homes, both here in Los Angeles and in Florida, Wolf.
Tonight, the first public statement from music mogul Sean Diddy Combs following raids on two of his homes as part of a possible sex trafficking investigation. CBS's Carter Evans reports on what authorities may have been looking for. There was nothing subtle when federal agents conducted high-profile raids at two large properties in Los Angeles and Miami, owned by music mogul Sean Diddy Combs. Raids that tonight his attorney calls a gross overuse of military-level force. Why a simultaneous cross-country search? Oh, I think they wanted this to be a bit of a surprise. It's a big raid, and what they were going in was to try to find all types of evidence. There are two distinct images of Combs, the iconic performer and the one named in multiple lawsuits accusing him of everything from rape to sex trafficking. Last December, Combs posted a statement saying, I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. The lawsuits so far have been in civil court. As for the latest searches... If it involves sex trafficking or drugs or weapons or other illegal behavior, it can easily go from a civil investigation to what we see now, a criminal investigation. TMZ published video, it says, was after the raids began. It showed Combs walking around Opelaka Airport near Miami. A short time later, at the same airport, Miami-Dade police arrested Brendan Paul for drug possession. Paul was described in a previous lawsuit as Diddy's mule, someone used to get drugs and guns. It has been outed today that uh, young Miami may have been transporting narcotics on Diddy's behalf. At least on one occasion, if not more. And it's also been outed that young Miami could possibly also be one of Diddy's exotic sexual workers. like a group of us I can't remember oh, yeah, I know you that's why I know you from I know where you remember now oh, okay yeah. all right <laughs> well now we're here <laughs> girl that was not what I was trying to talk about I just had a conversation with somebody that day. I said I'm really like I'm more like with a with a W like I'm on but define that though like I'm on <laughs> <laughs> Carisha, Carisha, say I'm single. I don't know who that is. And Carisha is, of course, Young Miami from the City oh, Girls. Young. Oh, okay. Um, and she says I'm single, but she's I'm really single. And mind you, she was in a situation with uh, Diddy, and they're in a new type of relationship where you could say we're together, but we're single, and we're doing this. But now she's like, I'm single, single. She's just a good hoe, <clears throat> as she supposed to be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Now, if it's she for a good hoe. like, do you see some resemblance? I don't want to say in yourself, but in like some other women who would be like, I'm going to go out here and get this bag because no, the bag is ain't going to get No, keep in mind, I don't let my pussy out like that, out the cage. There you go. No, no. It's a certain type of woman that's going to do a certain type of thing. Every woman going to go for the coin, but it all still yet depends. That's a man that she know is rightfully bisexual with his dick got shit on it. She's still sucking it. With no problem, literally, mm. literally, for two hundred and what did he give her two fifty? Yeah, yeah two two fifty. Yeah, that $2 ain't enough motherfucking money. Wait, you said that's not enough? That ain't enough money. How much? Are you out of your mind? Give me two million to be sucking and fucking on your gay ass. <laughs> Girl, boy, he got this. Now, Diddy's lawyer calls the law enforcement action an unprecedented ambush. He says his client is innocent, and he emphasized that Combs was never detained. In fact, he cooperated and even spoke with investigators. <laughs>
damn near fucking you in your mouth, bitch. And then cutting your fucking throat, bitch. Get her, 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 get her. Activist Tiffany Red had been working with Cassie on an album when she first met Diddy and says that she witnessed him verbally abusing her friend. Following Cassie's settlement with Diddy, Red penned an open letter in Rolling Stone about her experience. She spoke to me about the events that she says traumatized her. I don't think people understand what it's like to be traumatized by somebody famous and rich because you can't get away from them. Tiffany Red has written for the likes of Zendaya, Jason Derulo, and Jennifer Hudson. In 2015, she became friends with Cassie while writing songs for her album. At that point, Cassie and Diddy had been together for nearly eight years. In a lawsuit Cassie filed last month, she detailed the abuse she says Diddy committed, including physical assault. Red says although she did not know about the alleged physical assault while working with Cassie, she did witness verbal abuse on more than one occasion. What of which took place during Cassie's 29th birthday in 2015. Red says Diddy showed up at karaoke where Cassie and a group of friends were celebrating. So he had her back into the corner and he was like cussing her out with his hand in, his fit in her face. Later that night, Red, who was staying at Cassie's home, says she awoke to screaming. Oh, he's standing in the like living room area and she's there and he was like emotional singing. There you are. And I just was like, oh, he's talking to me. And I remember, like, I don't know if you know his, his what his voice sounds like, but, like, I felt like I was in the presence of his monster inside. And I remember, like, looking in his eyes, and I said to him, what did y'all do? Because I could see that she was, like, really sedated. That was the first time I'd ever seen her, like, high before. And then he says, tell your girl she wants some birthday <laughs> And we were like, well, I mean, he's saying this to me, and I'm like, well, she doesn't have to have sex with you if she doesn't want to. He was upset, like, you know, I guess she, that she didn't want to do with him whatever she, whatever he wanted, I don't know. I don't feel like I could advocate for myself in that moment. Like, I realized, like, oh, this guy is dangerous. Um, I mean, offering somebody $50,000 to abort a baby, whew, he must really want it gone bad. Um, I mean, in the beginning, like, the first three and a half years, he was... I mean, like the first three months, three, four months, he was really nice. But then after that, he was, he started being an asshole. So like I say, like the first three and a half years, he was like mean to me. So when you say mean, describe it. Um, He was abusive. He was like always belittling me and always like, he, I just, he was like mentally, emotionally and physically abusing me. It got really crazy that time. Uh, um, we was upstairs and he he had like, we were in his closet and he like pushed me and I fell to the ground. And, um, and then he got, he like stood over me. So I was like laying on my back and he stood over me and he started like punching me like this, like, he avoided my face, but he, like, started punching me, like, on the side of the, my head, and I was just, like, covering my face, and, um, he did that, he did that, and then, and then after he got done doing that, he, like, because he was standing, his legs were, like, sta in between me, so he, like, he, like, stomped on my stomach, like, really hard, and I, like, took the wind out of my breath, I couldn't even, I couldn't breathe, and he kept but he kept hitting me and I was like pleading to him, like, can you just, can you stop? I can't breathe. And he like stopped for a little bit. He, um, he like grabbed my hair from the back and like was um, like punching the back of my head. Well, some of the stuff I've been saying is coming true, but all of the stuff that I say is true and that's facts. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 
just with this Cassidy thing, Cassie thing, um, I didn't know her, but I knew somebody liked her, and that was Kim Porter. I didn't know Cassie, but I knew somebody who was going through the same thing she was going through, and that was Kim Porter. Will Harley, I got Kim Porter's sister right here. Unbelievable. Can't believe it. Live interview with Kim Porter's sister in Atlanta. You know what I'm talking about? She Pete. just got real. Tune in. She just got real. I'm going to let you know everything that's going on between Diddy and my sister. Stay tuned. It's coming soon. Come through. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm glad that you called me down or whatever and invited me because yeah. everybody want to know. I told y'all my way in the building again, not getting no sleep. I can't get no sleep. Kim Porter's sister invited me to Atlanta and, and told me that P. Diddy is going to try to kill me out. next. I'm airing him out. And Diddy, she, I'm airing you out. You did this shit to myself. I got to let the world know what you did. Wow. See, listen, Kim Porter wants to let the world know. So do you believe that this is what we want to know? Everybody want to know. If any questions that y'all want to ask Kim Porter's sister, please make sure y'all ask. Please. Do you believe that P. Diddy has something to do Absolutely. with your sister's Absolutely. untimely death? Then you see it was all in the news. You acting like you're trying to get in there. Please, you already know what happened to him. That's why you all on the news acting like you're trying to get in there too. Yeah, please. You you killed her. That's why you couldn't even go back in there. You so, just act like you was on the outside and you ain't do it. Like, that shit don't make sense. So you don't believe the story that he was trying to save her? Hell no. Wow. Man, she been dead for hours. Wow. So what about these parties? Was Kim Porter cool with P. Diddy having butt naked parties? <laughs> Listen. With a bunch this of is men? Why, this is why... He tried to silence my sister and did. We have breaking news to tell you about now. Model and actress Kim Porter, who shares three children with Sean Diddy Combs, has been found dead. Stu Mandel live over uh, the Porter's home, or Porter's home, I should say, in Toluca Lake. Stu? Well, that's right. It's actually out here, Toluca Lake, at the uh, corner of Woodbridge and Arcola. Now, apparently earlier this evening, uh, the uh, actress and uh, model, Kim Porter, who, as you said, shares three children with the, the music icon, uh, P. Diddy, was found here, passed away this afternoon. Now, they're saying that she did pass away from an illness, and it is natural causes. Right now, though, we do see a lot of activity at the house as friends and family are arriving and departing the home. Again, though, we understand that the model actress, Kim Porter, who shares three children with uh, the music mogul P. Diddy, did pass away this afternoon. Live in Sky 2 over the Toluca Lake area. I'm Stu Mandel. Back to you two in the studio. A lot of my friends have been kind of oppressed and pushed back and silenced and teased, you know, made fun of. But, you know, I'm always the one that kind of puts out the fire. I'm also the one that always runs to the defense of all my friends. So if you see uh, any other women, certainly women that I've come up with, certainly women that are, are mothers of my children, other of my kids that I love, I come to their defense. So if they're down and out or something's wrong, yeah, you're always going to see Kimora, big mouth me, running up to the gate, running up to help. And you know why? It's because I feel like I'm the one that can't be bowled over. Some of these other people can be bowled over. A lot of my women... You know, friends and other moms, they've gone through things. I've lost friends of mine. So people ask me, yo, and they send me clips of Cassie, I guess it's an affidavit to the courts, you know, of what she experienced. And it's like, it was the same thing Kim was going through. The same thing, bro. Kim was going through the same thing. The beatings. You know what I'm saying? Like I said before, and now I could say one time when I know Kim had defended herself and I told people this, and now everybody, after Cassie report comes out, everybody want to show the picture now. You see a picture on the internet going with Puff, right hand is in a bandage. That's the night I was called by Paul to meet him over at St. Luke's Hospital. He had a white T-shirt wrapped around his wrist because Kim had took the court, the uh, you know, where you open up wine, 
the corkscrew. She took the corkscrew and caught him on his wrist, defending himself. And he almost, I think he had, I know he tore some ligaments, but he almost hit an artery. I came close to the artery or either scratched it or cut it a little bit because he just kept bleeding, kept bleeding. And from that, that point on, he was hooked. That's when I knew, like, I knew when they was talking about people getting addicted and hooked on pain medicines, that's what happened to him. And it was from his right wrist that uh, he's reminded by Kim all the time. And um, I, I just miss Kim, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And I know we all go through grief and stuff like that. Uptown Records started with five people. Andre Harrell, I'll be sure, Heavy D, and Puffy. And Kim was the longest working employee because she was there from the very beginning. She was Andre's personal assistant. Mm -hmm. Kim is dead. Heavy D is dead. What's dead? Andre Harrell is dead. The only two left are Puffy and Al, and Al almost died. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Heavy D was found dead face down in the heart attack. Andre Harrell, heart attack. Kim died from pneumonia, but there's the first coroner's report that said that she died. It was ruled a homicide, and they found toxins in her body to prove that she had been poisoned. You know, they, they have poisons that create heart attack and pneumonia-like symptoms. Here we have the investigator's narrative, and they say that their in information sources are the Detective Patike and um, Michael Farzam, MD. So it says, investigation, on November 15th, 2018, at 13.05 hours, Officer Villanova from LAPD North Hollywood Division called Case Loan at the LA County Department of Medical Examiner Coroner to report this apparent natural death. It was reported that the decedent was found unresponsive bed by family members. That's how it's written. 911 was dialed and death was determined at the scene. There was no known medical history other than recent cold flu-like symptoms for the past few days. An in-house physician prescribed antibiotics and IV fluids. There was no known history of drugs or alcohol use. PMD Michael Fardum. And then up here it says Farzum. So I don't know if that's her like doctor that came to her home. I don't, I'm not sure. I was assigned this field call by Lieutenant Smith on the 15th of November, 2018 at approximately 13, 16 hours. I arrived on scene at approximately 14, 10 hours and departed from the scene at approximately 16, 33 hours. Foul play is not suspected. The decedent's fingerprint return and a routine search of the Los Angeles County Consolidated Criminal History Report System revealed no drug or alcohol related offenses. Forensic attendant M. Sierra and cor coroner investigator trainee L. Darabedian transported the decedent from the scene to the Forensic Science Center. And then it says informant slash witness statements. I spoke with Detective Petike at the scene and he related the following information. The decedent lived in the residence and the above location with her two minor children as well as with her friend and friend's daughter. The decedent's goddaughter, who was visiting the decedent, had been staying at the residence since November 12, 2018. The decedent had no pertinent medical history. However, she developed flu-like symptoms approximately four days ago and was treated by a house call physician. She was administered a saline solution with vitamin mixture by a nurse. Decedent did not have a primary medical physician. And the last time she was believed to have been examined by a physician was approximately two years ago when she, quote, had blood work done. She also traveled to an unspecified location in Africa and returned home approximately one month ago. She did not have any health complaints at the time she returned from her trip. On the evening of November 14th, 2018, the decedent said, stated she felt better and received a deep tissue massage from her goddaughter. She then watched movies with family members and went to bed at approximately 23.30 hours. The following morning at approximately 8.30 hours, the goddaughter awoke beside the decedent and observed her to be sleeping. She did not attempt to rouse her. 
The goddaughter then left for work. Oh my goodness. Oh my God. So she like passed away. We were next to her and she woke up and saw her and didn't know she was, oof. At approximately 1130 hours, the decedent was found unresponsive in her bed by her housemates. Uh, 911 was dialed and firefighters, paramedics from Engine 76 of the Los Angeles Fire Department responded to the scene. Firefighters and paramedics found the decedent lying supine in bed and, quote, rolled, unquote, her to a prone position to assess her backside. They then returned her to a supine position and death was determined at 1140 hours by paramedics Leon and Pugliosi. I spoke with Dr. Farzam at the scene and he related the following information. On 11 2018, the decedent contacted Dr. Farzam with complaints of sore throat lasting two days. He prescribed a Z pack at that time. On November 10th, her condition had not improved. A nurse responded to the residents at the above location and administered a saline solution with vitamins to the decedent. On November 12th, Dr. Farzam responded to the residents. Upon examination of the decedent, she was noted to have cold flu-like symptoms, including nasal congestion, sweats, mild cough, body aches, and sore throat. She also had a fever of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Her blood pressure and oxygen results were within the normal limits. Influenza swab and strep tests were reportedly negative. His diagnosis for the decedent at the time was viral flu-like illness. He administered, administered an intramuscular injection of 60 milligrams of Toradol to the decedent's gluteal region. Okay, so we know that that wasn't related to the bruise on her bicep. Um, she was given another one liter saline vitamin solution. On November 13th, 2018, the decedent responded to Dr. Farzam that she had no appetite. She was administered another mixture of saline with vitamins by the nurse. So almost a week later, and she's still not feeling well. On the 14th, the decedent spoke with Dr. Farzam and reported her temperature was 96. Okay, so a week later, it seems like her temperature has gone down from 102 to, okay, never mind. However, she also, okay, let me read that again. On November 14th, the decedent spoke with Dr. Farzan via the telephone and reported her temperature was 96 degrees Fahrenheit. However, she also noted that a, quote, mild streak of blood with phlegm, unquote, while she was coughing that day. She then received a massage and stated that she felt better. Despite feeling poorly, she continued to consume food and liquids, quote, a little bit throughout the period of her illness. Per Dr. Farzam, the decedent had no other pertinent medical or surgical history. She is not taking any prescription medications. She consumed alcohol on rare occasions and had no known history of drug abuse. Her family medical history was unknown. Scene description. The scene was a well-furnished, moderately well-organized master bedroom at the northeast end of a two-story multi-bedroom house in a residential area at the above location. A bed was noted along the south wall of the room. Multiple unopened or partially empty bottles of water, Pedialyte, and sports drinks were noticed on a nightstand, nightstand sorry, east of the bed and also on the dresser. Cups containing what appeared to be tea and water, a box marked azithromycin tablets, and a partially empty bottle of Tylenol were also noted on the nightstand east of the bed. Bowls containing what appeared to be tomato soup were noted in the room. A partially empty bottle of Zolpidem tartrate, which was not prescribed to the decedent, was noted in a drawer in the master bathroom. Zolpidem tartrate. So I guess Zolp Zolpidem titrate is a generic version of Ambien. The decedent was observed lying supine in the bed, partially on her right side, with her head to the south and feet to the north. The right side of her face was resting against a pillow. The right arm was bent, with the right hand resting against her right cheek. The left arm was also bent and resting against her left side, with her left hand near the right side of her abdomen. The right leg was slightly bent and resting on the bed. The left leg was extended straight out and resting over her right leg. 
evidence. No evidence was collected for this case. Next, we have body examination. The decedent was an adult black woman who appeared to be the reported 47 years of age with black hair, brown eyes, and apparent natural teeth. Congestion was noted to the sclerae. Upon palpitation of the anterior neck region, a small amount of blood was noted is issuing from the right nair. A small amount of white frothy, frothy sorry, sputum was also noted issuing from the mouth. Oh, she had foam coming out of her mouth? What appeared to be a contusion was noted to the left upper arm. Multiple small red dots and what appeared to be a small contusion was noted to the right upper arm. What appeared to be small contusions were also noted to the bilateral posterior upper legs. Piercings were noted to the bilateral ears. Implants were noted to the bilateral breast. A vertical line of discoloration was noted extending from the upper abdomen to the groin region. The back was unremarkable. No other scars, marks, or apparent signs of trauma were noted. Rigor was noted to be a three throughout the body. Lividity was fixed and appeared to be consistent with the decedent's position upon my arrival. Identification. Decedent was positively identified as Kimberly Antoinette Porter. Next of kin, they notified the son and other family members. Decedent was not married. I spoke with Detective Patike at the scene and he confirmed this information. Organ tissue procurement was not addressed with the family. And autopsy notification, it says no exam notification was requested. Signed, Michelle Lee and supervisor. And this was dated November 15th, 2018. This news has re-emerged over the last week, and I think that this is an important part of the puzzle when it comes to the Kim Porter case and, you know, what took place with her, how did she pass away, was there any, you know, malice when it comes to her passing, was it actually pneumonia or was she given substances in some way that mimics pneumonia? Ed Winter is an interesting name, and you guys may know who he is and where I'm going with this, or maybe you guys have no idea, and in that case, stay clued on. As Sean Diddy Combs faces the internet's wrath after being accused of significant allegations when it comes to Cassie, the passing of model Kim Porter, who was also the mother of Diddy's children, was allegedly investigated by the aforementioned policeman. Many now believe that the rapper played a role in the sudden passing of Ed Winter. 19th of March, 2023, TMZ announced that Ed Winter had passed away in his LA residence from natural causes. He passed away at the age of 72. Now, who is Ed Winter? He investigated the deaths of multiple celebrities, including Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, Brittany Murphy, Tom Petty, and many more. Many have expressed that the model's autopsy initially revealed that she died from low bar pneumonia, which many refused to believe, including Porter's ex-husband, Al B. Shaw, who really expressed the fact online at one point that the FBI should be involved. At the time of writing this article, there were no information online regarding the claims made by a number of internet users claiming Ed Winter con conducted Kim Porter's autopsy and that he was asked to re-examine the investigation surrounding her death. Still, a lot of people conjectured that Diddy was involved in Winter's passing. So it's not really confirmed that he was the one who, you know, studied Kim Porter's passing basically once she passed away. He obviously is somebody who de deals with a lot of celebrity deaths, you know, when it comes to um, Whitney Houston and, you know, her sitting in the bathtub as well as Michael Jackson. And obviously noting when it comes to these deaths that there were some kind of play that took place or they seemed very odd or something initially happened. Now, you know, in the relation to Ed Winter and Kim Porter, you know, many people are reporting that he also was involved in trying to find out what happened to Kim Porter and allegedly some parts of Kim Porter's family, you know, wanted her body to be exhumed, wanted there to be a reopening of the case of Kim. So as soon as something like this was coming around, you know, Ed Winter passed away of natural causes when his health was absolutely fine. There seems to be a pattern here when it comes to anybody in relation to or in circumference of PDD who passes away of natural causes or some kind of illness when they were absolutely fine prior to all of that. Andre was writing a book right before he died. Heavy D was working on a book before he died. Kim Porter was working on a book before she died. And I'll be sure was working on the documentary of his life. And then he goes into a coma. He yeah, was standing above me, I'm in a wheelchair, and he's talking to security. He had me hidden in the corner, and I'm in an emergency room. And then I remember um, him embracing me, putting me in his 
Escalade or whatever, and, and, and moving me, and I just remember, those are the big things that I remember, and wind up being in a hospital somewhere. This is in July 2000. 22 and then it was October in a coma for two months Al was close to death I was intubated I was on a ventilator had a tracheotomy um, I mean there was so many things going on to the point where they were considering sending me to hospice and what people don't truly understand unless you've been through this type of medical journey is taking for granted breathing mm. tying your shoes Speaking. As details of his health crisis began to surface, he received calls and letters from all over the world. Keep your spirit right. Know that we're praying for you, we love you, and everything is in God's hand. Has Puffy ever been in a coma? Has he, has anything happened to him? He must be the luckiest motherfucker because it seems like everybody that worked at Uptown Records from the very beginning just him. I heard somebody yell, you know, they shot at Biggie's car. And then um, I just jumped out of my car and I ran directly to his car. He was hunched over and I was just there. I was talking to him and the security officer that was driving my vehicle, I told him to just jump in his vehicle. Let's just try to rush him to the hospital. And that's what we did. Do you remember the last thing that you said to him or he said to you? Yeah. I mean, he was just basically saying, like, he couldn't wait um, for his album to come back, come out. That, you know, he was just happy that he had finished it. And um, he was just like, I just can't wait till my album comes out. And he just felt that when the album came out, it was going to clear up a lot of stuff because um, over the past two years, people have been talking about him in records. There had been the so-called controversy, and he had wanted to represent on his album of not even going in and feeding in towards, towards that negativity. And he felt proud that he didn't do that, do that. And he also had did a tribute record to California called Going Back to Cali. And he had just felt that, you know, once the album came out, a lot of fans would understand that, you know, that he wasn't on that BS. And he was, he was just trying to make good music and represent for everybody as a whole, internationally, East, West, Europe, Africa, wherever they was from that wanted to listen to his music and wanted to feel his point of view. He, he just wanted to accept them. And he wanted them to accept him. We've heard a lot of different theories on what happened. Mm -hmm. One of the theories the police are working on now is a, a money conflict with uh, someone out in Los Angeles. What's your theory? I know that's completely not true. Biggie didn't have no money conflicts with anybody. And as far as my theory, it would be inadequate for me to speculate. I would just be like everybody else to speculate on who did this or why it was done. I mean, one thing I do know is that it was evil, it was, it was ignorant, and it, and it hurts, you know what I'm saying? According to you, Tupac gets killed by the Southside Crips. He gets killed by Orlando Anderson, who's a member of the Southside Crips. Exactly. Now, earlier you said that Puffy put out this claim of, you know, yeah. I'll pay a million dollars if you get, get rid of right. Tupac and Suge. Tupac is now gone. What happened in terms of Keefe, Orlando, and Diddy at this point? So immediately in the aftermath, um, you know, Diddy hears about the shooting, finds out that there's, you know, been Tupac's been shot and is in the hospital in Las Vegas. And according to Keefe D, he gets a phone call. He's actually with Zip, the intermediary. And they're here, they're back in LA. And Zip takes a phone call, and it's Puffy on the other end of the line, hands the phone to Keefe D, and Keefe D, I'm sorry, Puffy asks him, man, was that us? Was it, you know, what just happened out there? Keefe D's like, yeah, that's us. Okay. So then there's that million dollars. So now there's this expectation of, yeah, the million dollars. So what happens next? So what happens next is, um, you know, Keefe D's, already under a separate investigation for his ongoing drug trafficking. Um, he never gets a chance to hook back up with Puffy um, until almost, what, six months later, where he's over at the Peterson Auto Museum when Puffy's back out here with Biggie, 
and he walks up to him to have a conversation about it. Well, Puffy's aware that the FBI's been watching him um, out here in Los Angeles, and the last thing he wants to do is be directly associated with this guy that he's had this agreement with to commit a murder. So he tells Keefe D, you didn't know, man. Now's not the time. We're good right now. And uh, you got the FBI, you know, I got the feds all over me. Listen, seven years ago, I'd have been like, yo, did you hire somebody to kill Pac? But no, you do it like a journalist. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, we wouldn't even get into nonsense like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's nonsense. Which we never believed, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Hey, how you doing? So, hmm, here today about this latest lawsuit with the P. Diddy, Puff Daddy, Puffy, Sean Puffy Combs, whatever you want to call them. Lawsuit that has come out involving the producer Little Rod. So basically his last two lawsuits, or last two major lawsuits, um, the one with Cassie, she made mention that Puffy made her carry his guns into nightclubs and wherever they went. And he threatened her to make her feel like she had to do so. And of while there were lots of things of importance, that stood out to me, and I'm gonna tell you why. In this lawsuit with the producer Little Rod, they were both essayed by him and threatened and physically harmed. But in this lawsuit, he appears to be a very young producer to me. But he said something very specific. As a means of threatening him, Puffy said, that's why I shot up the club in New York back in 1999 and let Shine take the fall for it. I wanted to hear a readback of testimony relating to Combs' former girlfriend, actress-singer Jennifer Lopez, who was in the Navigator when it was stopped by police. An officer testified that everyone in the SUV was ordered to put their hands on the vehicle, but Lopez walked away, saying she was going home. Well, and I do want to talk about all the great things that you're doing, but to your point, to get to the great, the bad, has to be acknowledged. Absolutely, I, I think. And I'm with the former bad boy, as yeah, they call it, the yeah, record label. So yeah. let's go, let's go, let's go. We're not far from where that night took place. And you've never told the details about it. You have never gone into great, um, uh, people wanna know what happened that night. I know that you've always said self-defense. When you drive by that area now, how does that feel to know what happened in there? <clears throat> well, I, I take the train and I walk, I, so I don't drive. Um, but I actually haven't walked uh, in that area. Was that deliberate? Have you wanted no, to No, I just haven't had the, you know, I haven't had the desire. That, you know, it's so long ago. And um, it's, to me, more of a blip on my uh, journey to where I was going which is always a world leader. That's so interesting that you feel it's a blip because it was and is the thing that defined you for so long. I am the woman who he shot in the face in that 1999, December 27th, 1999, Club New York shooting. I have told everyone ad nauseum since then, even the surgeon who did the surgery to take the bullet, I got shot in my face with a nine millimeter excuse me, nine millimeter hollow point bullet called a cop killer. I literally have told everyone and never changed what I said. I watched him. I got pow pow in the face. I watched him fire the gun. I've said it all this time. Even the surgeon who did my surgery to take out part of the bullet fragments that was aspirating into my lungs and try to remove as many bullet fragments as possible testified in the criminal trial that while they were putting me under, I was screaming, Puffy, pew, pew, me in the face. He testified in the criminal trial. It is in the record. They all knew he did it. Everybody knew he did it. But he paid off the club bouncer named Sharice and all these other people and the club owners with their video to hide the video. That's his M.O. I told everybody that. This man almost took my life, 
has traumatized my life, has caused undue harm, irreparable damage to my life, lied his behind off. I've had all these youngins on the internet harassing me, swearing that I'm making it up that he did it. And look what he did to little Rod. him oh you don't think i bust my gun i shot up the club in club new york and let shine take the fall for it i shot them people well 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 it only took 24 24 whole years for it to come out you see this tattoo this commemorates me getting shot it took 24 years for him to come out and say it i've been saying it all along but y'all pick and choose who y'all want to believe oh baby you ain't seen nothing yet. Not only did he pew, 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 pew me in the face, he also set off a course of harassment against me for the past 24 years. When I tell you the things I went through, there was a time in 2017 and 2018 where I got seven flats on my BMW, seven, the same tire, in a two-year span, seven on the same tire, and they were all new. Every time it happened, I had to get a new tire. I have the pictures to prove it. Harassing me. You want to know why? Because prior to Cassie, I was the only person to be victimized by him and then to successfully sue him and get paid. And he had to pay me out of his pocket. He has never gotten over that. Oh, baby. You see this Rico charge that's about to come? This conspiring and peering pew -pew up the club and ruining or attempting to ruin my life? As God is my witness, I will not stop until you suffer every single iota of punishment, until I have every second of recompense that you took for me. For every tear that I had to cry or my children had to cry, I am going to get a million back from you. I will not stop until you pay the price for what you did to my life. And for all you people out there on the internet and in cyberspace and in the far reaches of my life or the perimeters or wherever, who always like, oh, she just saying that to get some, hell, what you got to say now? What you got to say now? I had some youngins on the internet that ain't even old enough, that weren't even alive when it happened, Arguing me down, cussing me out, calling me everything but a child of God. Go check Instagram. It's there. Harassing my life. Harassing me. Oh, you lying. He ain't do that to you. You just want clout. You just chasing clout. What is that to chase clout about? How is that clout chase worthy? It doesn't even make sense. Well, I guess you, it would make sense in this new generation. But you better believe. I will have my say. I will have my say. Hashtag having my say. Hashtag the dopest nerd ever. Hashtag Ebb Talks. Y'all ain't seen or heard nothing yet. I've had my say. The best and the rest is yet to come. Biggie ain't here, so Big can't give you no receipts. He dead. Craig Mack can't give you receipts. He dead. I got with somebody. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to say their name. I'm going to say somebody that wanted to do another album with me. So I said, cool, I, go, I gave him my price. And the price was, to me, it was low. You know, and he was supposed to give me the money. And I go in the studio and I start banging out. So he came and was like, yo, I cut you a third of the money I'm supposed to give you. I said, you know what? And if you're going to do this and that a third, let's do it. You give me the money as we, you know what I'm saying? I'll take a third. Again, nothing happened. What was the issue between Craig Mack and Puffy? Craig Mack manager, right? Puff told Craig Mott if he didn't change management, 
he wasn't fucking with them no more. You understand? And they had a real big beef behind that. And Craig wasn't getting rid of his management. I guess the dude had been with him for a long time. So Craig said, yo, listen here, man. I'm not changing my managers because you want to. Because Craig wanted his money for his music. So Puff said, yo, I ain't fucking with that kid no more. Not at all. I, I was right there when he said that. Told Craig Mack, you don't change your management? I ain't fucking with you. What are you talking about? Who else? Black Rob can't give you receipts. He dead. How you feel about the situation with G-Dub? They saying that he got clemency by the governor, you know, so they saying that he going to be up for parole in 2025. Well, g Depp didn't know he had commit a murder. g Depp just thought he just had shot somebody. He was getting his life together. So, he, you know, I think he had turned to God or religion. So he turned himself in regarding that incident only to find out that that dude was murdered in the situation that he had with him. You understand? But uh, Governor Holcomb gave him clemency because the fact that he turned himself in, the fact that while he was in jail, he was a model citizen, got his associate's degree and did all the things that he was supposed to do so he could come back into society and try to be somebody. When he was with Bad Boy, you got to realize he came in with Black Rob. He was supposed to be Black Rob's artist. But Black Rob didn't have no paperwork on him. It was only, you my man, I'm going to bring you up here to Bad Boy. We're going to do this music together. You know, you're going to be my artist. And Puff synced that. And what'd he do? Snatched him away from Black Rob, put him on paper, you understand, and gave him a deal. And everybody else, you may sign paperwork so they can't talk about what I'm talking about. I'm the only one with the guts. Oh. They're not signing. Because I ain't need the money. All money ain't good money. Remember that. Remember that. Remember that. You know who to play with. We're going to get to it. What did Puff do to piss you the fuck off? How did he do you dirty if he did you dirty? And what is and what is doing dirty if a motherfucker puts you on? Mm, that's really good. Let me take my shades off of that. Um, now, I could say this because it's not something I didn't say to him. Puff, how, how do I want to say this? Me and Puff was like... I felt like I did more than I got credit for, more than I got paid for. You felt or did you do that? Um, Cause you said felt like okay. Feeling, let's clear that up. Then. You saying you feeling that? No, we gonna you... keep it with. I'm cause I'm trying to be nice. I never got paid what I was worth, and I never got the respect I was worth. So the disdain that I got for Puff is more like you trying to keep me here. Now. I'm not here. All my peers is up here. All my peers are bosses. When it's time, just like somebody raised somebody up, you know they did work with you. They go from your little man to maybe A&R to something else. He just kept trying to keep me right here like, like he didn't want me to grow at anything. Some viewers may find the following video disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. Before we get into this video, everything I say is not motherfucking fact in this bitch, so don't take it as such. Girls can't take my motherfucking mouth, bitch. My mouth is real and it's raw and it's watchy, bitch. I'm gonna give the girls exactly what the fuck they asked for. The girls is going to know my rap. Trust me. I wanna talk about you getting bot bitches who have my stomach oh so sick. First of all, you guys are talking about if you had all this money, you guys would be doing the same things that he's doing. Huh? <laughs> Y'all would be raping, allegedly. What's up, man? You good? I'm good. How are you? All right, doing? young brother. Everything's good? Everything's Selling great. out arenas and everything? Yeah. Starting to act different, huh? You, you, ain't, you ain't been calling me and hanging out the way we used to hang out. Well, I mean, you haven't... 
I mean, you try to get in contact with me, you know, through all my, you know, business, you know, partners and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But you, you never really got my number, so. Right. Okay. My number? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. Tell you my number. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So as soon as you turn 16, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna let you rock this every time. You right. Yeah. Like, yeah. This gonna be yours. So every oh, time you come okay. in LA, it's a little dusty, but you know, let me get the front shot in. Man. Okay. Okay. All right, so so I'm gonna be driving this yeah, next yeah. year. Yeah, when you get 16, you come down and you gotta, you know, wear your seat. I mean, I'm 15. Thing. You could ride in the passenger seat. I got my permit. Now that, not yet. No. All right. No, 16. No, no, no. 16. Slow All down. Right. Let's slow down, Josh. Okay. Let's slow down. Okay. One, one step at a time. But yeah, yeah. The keys is yours when you, you know. When you get 16, and, and we're going to go full, buck full crazy. We're going crazy. Crazy. I'm taking this out tonight. What you want to do? What you want to do over the next 48 hours? 48 hours. Let's go. Um, are we gonna, let's just go get some girls. Let's go hang with some girls. A man after my heart. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Moved to New York City. And I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn <laughs> some... Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's In the 90s. Do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop, right? No, not really. I mean, you said that. I know you can't go into detail, but you said that uh, it was a situation where Daddy sent him to the hospital? Let us explain that to you. Let us your mom explain that to you. And the hospital was in Scarsdale, New York. I Come mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, <laughs> and it was, but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was, it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't and, say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say that. Didn't, <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh huh. Biggie Smalls was Biggie there. Biggie Smalls was there. Lil Kim, Craig Mack. All know, these people all are hanging these, around. All, yeah, man. Faith Evans. Jody C, Mary okay? J. Blosh. They ain't know nothing about this shit. Oh. <laughs> I was having a good time. You know what I mean? Does he have you doing any chores? Are you doing dishes at all? I mean, to keep you humble somewhat? Or are you just like, can you stay up till four in the morning with them and party? I mean, I could. I yeah. actually stayed up longer than them. <laughs> and and, and what do you have money? What's going on? I mean, I had like per diem. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, had, I had like, you know, what like a, a living. life. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. 14 years old. You're a dad now. Would you ever send your kid to Puffy Camp? <laughs> Hell no. no. My name's Ava. I'm a Scorpio. No, no, no. What's your last name? Oh, Ava Combs. What's your oh. other last name? Ava Baroni. Ava Baroni Combs? Yes, it's, it's breaking news. Diddy adopted a white child. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to tell them the story about how I adopted you. you but you still have beautiful parents that mature my child also. But please, please tell the story. So, I was on the streets, and then Papa Combs decided to, that he would like to be a caring man, so then he saw me and decided to pick me up and said to come inside and play with his kids. you like Madonna adopted kids and everybody else adopted kids, Charlize Theron, everybody that's ever adopted Sandra Bullock. I adopted you because I felt that you could, you know, um, enjoy also having a black parent to take care of you and help you out. So um, um, just clarify, because it's, it's crazy out here online. So, so <laughs> I, I, I played with the kids, and I got permission from your mother. And to say all of that, to just make it, because it's crazy out here. Um, well, I met Jesse and Dwyla when I was six months old. Six months. Yeah. And six then months. we basically are sisters, all four sisters. of us. So. Six and months is crazy. I always come over. Yes. And, and it's Ava mm -hmm. Brioni Combs. Come on. 
beating allegedly. <laughs> Tiffany Red had been working with Cassie on an album when she first met Diddy and says that she witnessed him verbally abusing her friend. Following Cassie's settlement with Diddy, Red penned an open letter in Rolling Stone about her experience. She spoke to me about the events that she says traumatized her. I don't think people understand what it's like to be traumatized by somebody famous and rich because you can't get away from them. Tiffany Red has written for the likes of Zendaya, Jason Derulo, and Jennifer Hudson. In 2015, she became friends with Cassie while writing songs for her album. At that point, Cassie and Diddy had been together for nearly eight years. In a lawsuit Cassie filed last month, she detailed the abuse she says Diddy committed, including physical assault. Red says although she did not know about the alleged physical assault while working with Cassie, she did witness verbal abuse on more than one occasion. One of which took place during Cassie's 29th birthday in 2015. Red says Diddy showed up at karaoke where Cassie and a group of friends were celebrating. So he had her back into the corner and he was like cussing her out with his hand in, his fit in her face. Later that night, Red, who was staying at Cassie's home, says she awoke to screaming. Oh, he's standing in the like living room area and she's there and he was like emotional singing. There you are. And I just was like, oh, he's talking to me. And I remember, like, I don't know if you know his, his, what his voice sounds like, but, like, I felt like I was in the presence of his monster inside. And I remember, like, looking in his eyes, and I said to him, what did y'all do? Because I could see that she was, like, really sedated. That was the first time I'd ever seen her, like, high before. And then he says, tell your girl she wants some birthday <laughs> And we were like, well, I mean, he's saying this to me, and I'm like, well, she doesn't have to have sex with you if she doesn't want to. He was upset, like, you know, I guess sh that she didn't want to do with him whatever she, whatever he wanted, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I could advocate for myself in that moment. Like, I realized, like, oh, this guy is dangerous. Well, some of the stuff I've been saying is coming true, but all of the stuff that I say is true, and that's facts. You know what I'm saying? Uh... Just with this Cassidy thing, Cassie thing, um, I didn't know her, but I knew somebody liked her, and that was Kim Porter. I didn't know Cassie, but I knew somebody who was going through the same thing she was going through, and that was Kim Porter. Killing, allegedly. I heard somebody yell, you know, they shot at Biggie's car, and then... Um... I just jumped out of my car and I ran directly to his car. He was hunched over and I was just there. I was talking to him and the security officer that was driving my vehicle, I told him to just jump in his vehicle. Let's just try to rush him to the hospital. And that's what we did. Do you remember the last thing that you said to him or he said to you? Yeah. I mean, he was just basically saying like he couldn't wait. Um, for his album to come back, come out, that, you know, he was just happy that he had finished it. And um, 
he was just like, I just can't wait till my album comes out. And he just felt that when the album came out, it was going to clear up a lot of stuff because um, over the past two years, people have been talking about him in records. There had been the so-called controversy, and he had wanted to represent on his album of not even going in and feeding in towards, towards that negativity. And he felt proud that he didn't do that, do that. And he also had did a tribute record to California called Going Back to Cali. And he had just felt that, you know, once the album came out, a lot of fans would understand that, you know, that he wasn't on that BS. And he was, he was just trying to make good music and represent for everybody as a whole, internationally, East, West, Europe, Africa, wherever they was from that wanted to listen to his music and wanted to feel his point of view. He just wanted to accept them, and he wanted them to accept him. We've heard a lot of different theories on what happened. Mm -hmm. One of the theories the police are working on now is a, a money conflict with uh, someone out in Los Angeles. What's your theory? I know that's completely not true. Biggie didn't have no money conflicts with anybody. And as far as my theory, it would be inadequate for me to speculate. I would just be like everybody else to speculate on who did this or why it was done. I mean, one thing I do know is that it was evil, it was, it was ignorant, and it, and it hurts, you know what I'm saying? What's going on? I shouldn't even be saying allegedly at this point because he paid all this money to Cassie. Yeah, read that, you nasty hoes. <laughs> and just a day after music mogul Sean Diddy Combs was accused of sexual assault and years of abuse in a new, York, new lawsuit filed by R&B singer Cassie, word of a settlement overnight. ABC's Morgan Norwood is here with the update. Good morning, Morgan. Hey, good morning to you, Ariel. Though Cassie and Diddy did not detail the terms of that agreement, the settlement quickly shuts down the potential for a trial and the process of legal discovery. That's when evidence in the case Case is often made public. They're making her do freak offs, which is confirming what people have been saying for years. Thing that was happening recently was that with the whole cancellation of Diddy, you know, Diddy got canceled. With because of Cassie? Like she abortion. took it back though. I know, but like it's unclear. So he, but this was something I've been talking about for years because he, it's like a, now a documented thing that I saw him like at a party in Miami. Like I was at a party in Miami that I should not have been at, like some real black excellence shit that <laughs> I was not deserving to be at, but I went with the DJ. Yeah. And I took ecstasy and I ended up wandering around in some mansion on Star Island and I end up walking, I guess it was his mansion. And I end up, it's all like just hot, it's all hot black people. Yeah. Like, and then just like one moron with an afro and everyone's like, how do Oh, right, when you had an afro. They're like, whose man is this? <laughs> yeah. But I came in and I basically saw him, I walked in a room I shouldn't have walked into and I saw him like hooking up with a dude, basically like full spooning situation. This guy, Felix the house cat, who's like a producer, whatever. I then told the story on a podcast and then his people called me and were like, you need to say you were joking. Like say you're a funny guy and like you made it up for the yeah. views. And I was yeah. like, but I, no, but I did not. I saw it. And he saw me when I came in. Were you like, like a little scared? Yes. Yeah, because everyone in the room like stopped because I opened the door and was like, is this the bathroom? And everyone was like, no, this is a room where like celebrities, like male celebrities hook up. Yeah. It's like some glitterati shit. Yeah. Um, and then he basically had people call me and like threaten me and like tell me that if I didn't take it back and say I was joking. And you still didn't take it back? Confused, no. Why? And then I talked about it on Hot 97 and they wouldn't air it. Um, Ebro, who does the morning show on Hot 97, they, so Hot 97 always kept me on a pre-record because they were like, what are you going to say? <laughs> yeah. They would never let me do a live interview. And I told the story and then afterwards he was like, I'm not going to let you, I'm not going to run this interview because like Diddy's insane and he'll, like he blew up Kid Cudi's car and all this shit. So and I, and I, I was feel like, like you did that on purpose. Like you're like, you wanted to see if he what he'd do to you. No, I wanted to get killed by Diddy. <laughs> but now, he, now everyone just found out that he like blows up people's, Kid Cudi finally told the story. Oh, he I've did? I've been saying this for years. I've been like, oh, oh Kid Cudi is cute, right? <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> like fuckable? <laughs> Yeah. No, like, he seems like a good guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, like, he's, you know, the original, like, sort of, like, he kind of invented, like, anxiety, depressed rap. Yeah, yeah, Because no one, like, was doing that. And then he was like, I'm sad and, like, on, like, medication. Right, right. You know right. what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, like, everyone And then was, like, Logic did it. A lot um, of people, like, started being, yeah, like, yeah. I'm sad and, like, I like. But he was the first one to be, like, I'm on Wellbutrin. Yeah. Um, but I've been talking about this Diddy shit for years, and now it's, like, out there. What room was that? Wait, uh, they say, uh... 
Nah, I ain't gonna say that. I heard about that though. But I ain't about to say that. But what? what was I ain't it? about to say that on, on my side. You and Diddy? You and Diddy? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you and Diddy. You and Diddy what? You and Diddy. No. They, they said he was. Him no. and Diddy what? I'm just saying the rumor. I ain't never heard this one. They said he was. He was How you knew that? How you, how you know now I'm about to Google because I ain't never <laughs> heard this one. I'm saying because you. That's the, nobody would ever say that one. Oh, that, yeah. So here goes Envy. They said that he said he was Diddy's boy toy. What? I was in Jamaica with him. Oh, I see it now. See? Is that well, what I can't Osiris in Jamaica with his alleged boo Diddy. Now, now, Fifth, when you continuously call Puff gay, does that affect no. your relationships in Hollywood? I don't call. No, I don't call. I don't call him gay. I said, let I, me read this. Let me read okay, it, read. Fifth. Oh my god! Sorry, I can no longer Shades help confused. you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under the leadership of Puffy Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow. Then the thieves. In theaters, January. Oh, that's <laughs> why I get tired. I was about to get tired. Yeah, that's yeah, promo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he so said gay I, and happy. Yo, no, no, no. I'm just saying screwed. to you, look, look, look. You always say, Jack, like, that's why you get invited to Puff Party. Yeah, <laughs> you know the reason. Listen, listen. <laughs> I'm on saying that because of the, the what's the name interview? Nori. The Drake Champs. Yes, yes. <laughs> what's what's going on, my brother? How you doing? Oh, man. Oh, man. Yo, it's Groove here. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Happy birthday, yeah, birthday, birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday to you. Woo! Happy birthday. It's fabulous. <laughs> the only nigga that got the name that I want. get. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday to you. He says things. He doesn't even know what he's saying. It's like fruity. Hey yo, Rastafari, Rastafari. Hey yo, don't do that. Yeah, that's what I said. That's why I said let me pick it up. I want to pick it up from right there. This is why I gotta pick it up from right there. Look at this nigga. This is a very nigga. Go ahead. No, 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 bro. Take killing. Look, look, look. Come tell the story, bro. Bro, we, bro, we intoxicated. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, oh, Groovy, oh, you Groovy you helped me build that yeah, beautiful, you, nice you, guy, Rastafari you, brand you of yours, me, huh? I love this drink, you put my bag you. I like when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, where you put my bag Daddy, I like when, you, when oh, you're right scrambling here, right here. and scraping no, for no, no, shit. No, 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 I, got I like and that. Shit. You know, I'll be practicing. I got yeah, there you go. Shit. Got your notes. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to go over that one. Make a wish. Just blow it out. It's your birthday every day. Every day is a birthday on Drink Champs, goddammit. I'm in. Okay. He said something fabulous and he goes, yo, <laughs> no, we, no, but me and you, we ain't party. Like, we need to party. Did you miss me, though? Mm. For real, because we, I'm I saying, miss, it seems like a thing. I miss his birthday with party, Puff, man. Man, but I'm talking about for him. your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? We want to thank you. Come here. Don't, don't, don't sit on the bed or nothing. No homo. No, just, just don't get close to the bed. Don't get close to the bed. But it's just like, yo, we want to thank you for hosting the thing, man. Man, you, you, it's been a pleasure. You didn't have to do it and you did. No, no, I definitely didn't have to do it. I, I definitely didn't have to. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not getting the bed. Uh, you know, shout out to him and what he did. I'm just gonna, if we can, just let's let's just put the camera a little this way, just so we're not. I don't want my shot to even, like, I don't want it to come close to the bed at all. I should look like he fresh off goddamn plane. I should, I should, I should. Fresh off the guard stage. That's my brother right here from day one. We used to wake up and, I mean, damn, pause, but like, check this out. I mean, I mean, back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the, over the Frosted Flakes, you know what I'm saying, before Paws was invented, you know what I'm saying, but it's my brother for real, we used to actually wrestle off of the, off of the Frosted Flakes because he used to always get up early with me, and now he's one of the richest stars in the world, and I'm yo, like, yo, what, what the, the fuck did Puff just say? Nobody's gonna acknowledge this for me, Puff just said we used to wrestle over the Frosted Flakes. And we're streaming live. Up, that was stupid. I just don't understand why you guys are also victim shaming in this bitch talking about why didn't people come out earlier? Hello? All these dead bodies for years? And then you're talking about, um, for example, look, there has been confirmed stories of him blowing up cars and trying to throw people off balconies. One of the other allegations um, in the Cassie Ventura lawsuit concerned Kid Cuddy. This is from Michael Velli from YouTube. Will the feds investigate the rumors that Kid Cudi's car was blown up by Diddy because he dated Cassie Ventura? For fax purposes, Kid's Cardi, Kid Cudi's car was blown up. Absolutely, I think they'll investigate it. I think they'll, in, they're will they taking everything that's been filed, they're combing through it, and they're going to in, turn over every leaf or every, um, every rock, every... Um, car, so to speak. And anything that they can can use against him, um, they're going to investigate and try to use it against him. So definitely. Mm. 
Yeah. Let's stay with uh, you. Can I also say it just goes to his access. It, it, if you can blow someone's car up, it just goes to um, the reach that you have, you know, um, and it just substantiates um, someone's fear of him, especially, you know, we were talking about witness protection earlier, you know, he has reach. He can send someone um, to blow up a car if he so desires over um, a, a, love itch, a love issue, you know, well, spurned love interest or something of that sort. So. Yeah. I'm just saying, y'all bitches are not thinking. And if you're a sick, nasty bitch, get off my page because this ain't the page for sick, nasty bitches. I don't like sick, nasty bitches. And it ain't about skin color. Y'all keep saying, oh, R. Kelly, oh, Michael Jackson. Hold on. Michael Jackson is different. Those people have come out and said they lied or they have been caught or something of the sort. Now, R. Kelly, Bill Cosby, What's going on? It don't matter about block, 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 bitch. You're making it a block thing. If you're a sick bitch, you're a sick bitch. All these sick bitches can go. Pink, green, yellow, all of them. And then just last month, a former employee of Combs filed a suit also uh, in the state of New York accusing him of sexual assault, of sexual harassment, and, quote, grooming. That former employee stated that he had worked for Combs between 2022 and 2023. All these bitches are sick and y'all can go. I don't know what y'all got going on at home, the sick, nasty bitches that are on my channel watching and supporting Diddy, talking about take this video down. Uh-uh. Y'all must be doing the same thing at home or want to do the same thing. And if so, y'all need to go to jail too. And when y'all go to jail, I hope they provide mental help so y'all don't get out and do the same nasty, sick things to people. I, ooh, my stomach. Yeah.